Yes. And how are you? Welcome to the Health and Communities Committee. Hello, thank you very much for having me. We'll just do a an introduction and then you can come on you'll be coming on first then to do your presentation. Just let me know when you're ready for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody on there now. I think maybe there's just one or two uh, chairs that we're waiting on. That's every green mark. Morris's green coming. I was having bother getting signed in, but he will be signing in. He's, he's just texted me there to say that he's having bother, but he will be on online. Okay. okay. I think that's everyone then. So we'll make a start. Okay. Um, Chairman, thank you. Um, I'll start just with the summons. Uh, members, you are hereby summoned to attend the virtual meeting of the Health and Community Committee on Thursday the 11th of February 2021 at 4 p.m. Um, so starting um, just really with attendance. So um, Alderman Devaney. Here. Here. Alderman Guy. Here. Alderman Wark. Councillor Barr has been delayed um, but will join us later. Uh, Councillor Burke. Councillor Duffy. Sure. Councillor Edwards. Here, Karen. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Ferguson. Down. Councillor Harkin. Here. Councillor Logue. I've seen her come on. Sorry, Karen. Sure. Thanks, Patricia. Councillor McKee. Councillor Mooney. Here, Karen. And Councillor Riley. Here, Karen. And can I just do a double check then, um, just for my own um, records? Uh, Councillor Burke. All okay. Karen. Councillor Wark. Sorry, Alderman Wark. I'll get inside then, so I'll be on later. And Councillor McKee. Okay, well, should we just let them date us in the chat box then? Yeah, I see, I see Rory has just joined the meeting there. So. Yeah. And Graham as well. Graham as well. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, then. Um, I'll read out the statement for remote meetings. Um, uh, I'd like to remind everyone uh, who's in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by their public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with the Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you're consenting to be informed and to the use and storage of those images 
for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council of Privacy may be found on the website. Okay, uh, thank you everyone and welcome to uh, Health and Communities meeting on Thursday the 11th of February. Um, good day for everybody here. And today we have a deputation uh, by Erin McFeely um, of the Health and City, World Health Organization European Healthy Cities Network. And she's going to give us a presentation today. So Erin, whenever you're ready, you can take it away there. Very welcome. Thank you very much, Cher, and um, thanks for having me uh, this afternoon um, and giving me the opportunity to update you on um, the Dairy and Strabane Healthy City and District designation to the World Health Organization European Healthy Cities Network. Um, I am Chief Executive of Developing Healthy Communities, which is the organization which coordinates uh, our local designation to uh, the WHO network here locally. Um, and the purpose of my report today is to update you um, and to seek your support for maximizing the potential impact of the WHO Healthy Cities network designation and brand. Um, and of course, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you have, um, time allowing. Um, so COVID-19 has sadly demonstrated to us that there's an inextricable link between the health um, and economy um, of our communities. Um, and the COVID-19 COVID recovery will really compel us to see health and economy as two sides of the same coin. Um, and for this reason, I think that Healthy Cities is uh, the key framework um, which will promote this joined up approach um, to our COVID recovery. Um, and I'd like to present that to you as an opportunity today um, and to particularly for the Council as the lead agency on Healthy Cities here um, in the local area. Um, I also wanted to update members on the New Ideas Fund, um, which is uh, which the Developing Healthy Communities, our organisation, is um, supporting the administration of here locally um, in Derry and Strabane. So I can tell you a bit about that as well. Just in terms of the background, uh, hopefully uh, members will be familiar that Derry and Strabane District Council has um, successfully completed phase five and phase six um, of the World Health Organisation Healthy Cities Network. Um, and that following approval of this committee, uh, an expression of interest to join phase seven was submitted uh, by the mayor. Um, the process to complete that designation um, was paused due to COVID-19 um, and we're now picking that back up again. Um, and there will be an opportunity for members to engage in that process. So just in terms of why we would be a member of the Healthy Cities Network, um, there are some key benefits outlined um, in the report that I've submitted. Um, designation really showcases our global health leadership um, in the local area, um, and it provides uh, an open space to encourage collaboration um, and innovation to flourish. Um, and it is broad collaborative church. So. Um, it brings in uh, private, public, community sectors, our academic partners, um, and it encompasses uh, areas of interest as diverse as housing, transport, age, arts, um, all under the holistic framework um, of the Healthy Cities uh, six Ps. Um, and you'll see that in the diagram included uh, in the paper, um, the six Ps that look at people, place, participation, planet, prosperity, and peace. Um, and I think it's also good to um, have a discussion about what Healthy Cities is not. So Healthy Cities is not seeking to create a new plan. Um, it seeks to align and showcase uh, the great work that's already happening in our city and district under um, one framework and one network. So our designation would um, be aligned to our strategic growth plan and a number of other local initiatives, which um, again, showcase best practice 
and, and health leadership. Um, it's not facilitated by developing, it's not owned by, by developing healthy communities. Healthy Cities is facilitated by us. Um, it's a politically driven movement um, and it's overseen by a number of strategic partners through a leadership group. Um, and that includes the council, the public health agency, uh, the health and social care board and the housing executive. Um, and I've included in the report a couple of examples um, of how our organisation has sought to bring this initiative to life um, locally um, and to bring about a collaborative space for health innovation. So in 2020, we ran a number of online seminars um, which looked at issues with, which were at the forefront of health and wellbeing concerns in our communities. Um, and again, they worked in partnership across the PHA, the council, the university, uh, the office of the mental health champion um, and others. Um, and they were highly valued um, by participants from across um, sectors. And we plan to uh, keep that going um, in the coming year. Uh, the key issues around creating a holistic approach to health and wellbeing, I think, have captured um, the phase seven application um, will set out prior priority uh, areas for action, um, as well as examples of good practice. And as I said, this will be informed by our current strategic inclusive growth plan, um, as well as a broader cross sector older engagement um, with the aim of creating an overarching framework uh, which draws on much of the planning and the good work already happening within the council. So key to that will be um, input from our strategic partners as well as broad uh, public engagement. And to that end, um, I wanted to bring to your attention that we're planning to hold an online conference um, in April of this year. Um, a, a similar event was sadly cancelled in March of last year, um, but we are aiming to bring that online this year um, and we would welcome your attendance. Also, by way of update, um, the Healthy Cities uh, Business and Technical Conference took place in December um, and a designation attended um, from Darian Straban, which included um, our Deputy Mayor, Alderman Graham Work. Um, uh, and at that conference, a political statement was endorsed, um, which was the de Declaration of Healthy Cities for Building Forward Better. So um, that is really a call to action um, as part of a global community to adopt an economy of well-being going forward um, and recognising the importance of cities um, in placemaking, planning, governance um, and utilising and building on our community assets. Um, to build forward from COVID and forward from the pandemic. To tell you a bit more about the Ideas Fund, um, the Ideas Fund is a new grants program. It's run by the British Science Association um, and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, and it enables the development and testing of ideas that are related to mental wellbeing. So it aims to um, connect community groups um, and researchers to work together to bring their ideas to life. Um, Jerry and Straban, Council area is one of only four areas in the UK um, that is uh, part receiving a fund of over three million pounds. Um, so it's significant external funding coming into the area and we've been really excited and overwhelmed by the response to that fund um, with, uh, I think, over 30 ideas being put forward so far. And I know that Derry is actually leading the way um, in this fund uh, across the four areas. So I think that there will be great work coming out of that and I'm happy to keep you um, up to date on it. Um, so just running through the final uh, sections of the report um, in terms of financial implications, maximizing by maximizing the profile of Healthy Cities brand and Healthy Cities designation, um, the council can get better value for money out of its annual contribution to the World Health Organization, um, which it pays to be part of the network. Again, the visible the visible promotion um, will enhance uh, the council's commitment to tackling health inequalities and, and put that at the top of the agenda. And as I've mentioned, the Ideas Fund is bringing external funding into our area. Um, 
So in summary, um, this report would recommend that uh, the Council demonstrates support for the Healthy Cities movement by maximising the visibility and the engagement um, in the Healthy Cities brand. Um, and that we use that brand and that designation as a way to um, reinforce our approach to building forward from the COVID crisis. Um, it also recommends that the Council promotes and supports the development of an open, local and cross-sector network of people within our city and district who can access the benefits um, of us being part of the European network. Um, that members receive regular updates on the progress of healthy cities um, and relevant information coming from the network, um, which will include approval of the phase seven application um, later in the year um, and an annual report or presentation. Um, we'd like to recommend that members attend the Healthy Cities Online Conference when it comes around in April and we can send more details of that. And also um, for members to endorse and promote um, the ideas fund, which is offering the opportunity for community led projects um, linked to improving mental wellbeing to be delivered in our area. I think that's it. And thank you for that detailed report. Um, I'm going to open it to the floor now. Uh, we have a few indicated speakers here. so. First of all, um, Rachel, sorry, Councillor Ferguson, you'd like to come in first. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Erin, for the presentation. And thank you for coming to um, see us here in the health and communities. I know how much work you've done over the, the, the directions I've had with you last year and this year. So uh, I know it's um, you still lot for the community. Uh, I'm happy to propose this um, report. I think it's a great idea. I think it's something that we need to move on to the, the phase five. I'm really keen on, on the fact, like you say, that the, the COVID-19, the pandemic, the positives that we can take away from that is seeing that the health and economy, there is a huge link there and we need to work on that. And within the diagram there, you have the environment incorporated, but especially for something like yourselves, and you support a lot of community groups that I would have interactions with. It's a community led initiative and it's kind of trying to find that holistic approach so absolutely I just wanted to no real questions or anything just wanted to endorse it and, and propose it and thank Erin for for coming today thanks chair thank you Rachel thank you Councillor Ferguson uh Councillor Devaney Ald Alderman Devaney sorry sorry no, be careful be careful <laughs> no first of all um I want to say thanks Erin um for the presentation here uh, and you've hit on quite a number of the topics here the impact uh, and the health uh, and the economic issues and around the city uh, and our council area with COVID-19 and I do agree wholeheartedly with you that sharing expertise and be best practice is the way forward and that we have a, a holistic approach to health and well-being as we come into the recovery for 19 uh, or for out of COVID-19 and look um, once again, our party has no problem in supporting the WHO. There are no issues there. And it is good news to, to welcome the Ideas Fund, um, which is money by the, the British Science Association, 3.29 million and, and next in position. And look, um, once again, we support the move into phase seven um, to for uh, to deliver the rest of this project and you know promote um, the health and well-being. It's good to see that you have um, an online conference coming up because it's the way forward, especially probably for this year during the pandemic. And hopefully next year we'll see some light out of that. And, you know, the Healthy Studies Initiative has to be welcomed as well. And I have no problem in endorsing and seconding um, the, all the proposals here. Just keep up the good work, Aaron. Job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Um, I have no other indicated speakers here, so all's left me to do is thank you again for your presentation, and I wish you all the best and full support what you are doing. Uh, so, sorry, I thought that was somebody else coming on there. Uh, so, you know that, that you have the full backing of the Council, anyway, and everything we really hope to be involved in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Knight. Uh, 
topic, so we'll move on now to chairperson's business. Um, I don't have a, a few things here. So, first of all, I'll start off by saying um, I'd like to can I know this was talked about yesterday in, in environment and regeneration, but uh, they condemn the attacks on our council staff in the Skag Road last week, and also um, in the incident in the, of assault that happened and the member of security at the Pennyburn Recycling Centre. And no one should go to the, uh, their work and feel threatened when going about their normal daily life and their job. And um, hopefully the culprits can be caught uh, and charged. I'd also condemn the two brutal punishment attacks in Craigan. Once again, guns on the street, no place for guns in society, in our society. This is, this is the third meeting I've chaired and every, every meeting it seems to be we're talking about this here. Um, no matter what these persons are perceived to have done, it does not give anyone the right to carry out such reckless actions against another human being. Um, and that's all I have for chairperson's business. So I'm going to have a few indicated speakers. And first of all, Councillor Farrell was next. Um, thanks, Chair. I, I just wanted to raise an item briefly uh, about addiction services across our city and district. Um, obviously, addiction is, is a scourge in our society, and I'm sure there's not many families across the city and district that have been left unaffected by it. Um, obviously, there have been renewed calls by, by young Tams and White uh, for a detox centre in the city, and whilst such a facility would not fix the problem of addiction. It would be a step in the right direction. Um, I think we as a council sh should contact the decision makers, be it the health minister, the Western Trust, the Health and Social Care Board. Uh, they ask, what are your plans to improve addiction services across our city and district, um, including a detox facility and I am aware that the mayor, Brian Tierney, sits in the local commissioning group and he raised this very issue uh, in the last week. I'm also mindful of the UK government's new decade, new approach commitment uh, for additional funding to support the Dairy Addiction Centre. And my colleague, Mark H. Durkin, pressed Arlene Foster on the floor of the assembly on Monday on that issue. Uh, so I think we should contact the British Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, to ask him, right, what are you doing about this or what have you done about this and, and when can we see actual delivery? And finally, I think we should invite representatives from the local addiction sector to present the council so we can hear firsthand the challenges that the sector is facing on a daily basis and to hear what solutions they have to the growing addiction problem uh, that our society faces. Um, mental health is the poor relation of health and addiction is, is the poor relation of mental health. So I think we as a council should play a key role in lobbying for improved addiction services uh, for the people across our city and district. So I will put my proposal in the chat box now and hopefully one of my party colleagues seconds that. There you go, Chair, thank you. I'm happy to second it. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for that, Councillor Farrell. I um, have a number of indicated speakers, and I'm sure they want to speak in this. So, uh, Councillor Doyle is first. Do you want to speak to this proposal? Yeah. I'll take it. Just, just a general comment, uh, Chair. Um, yeah. And I appreciate you letting me on. Um, I am bringing a motion forward to full council in relation to this. Um, just really wanted to let uh, members know, um, and just in terms of uh, the the commissioning um, of, of this service, um, I know it was raised in the assembly during the week, as as uh, Rory mentioned. Um, and actually, what the first minister came back with and said was it was a matter of prioritisation. Um, so I do. Uh, support what uh, what Rory has uh, has written down here, um, and certainly in in um, I would hope that they would the the SDLP and other parties would support my motion coming forward uh, for council about this because dual diagnosis is also um, a massive issue, um, and the nice guidance um, for that is something that's that's under the 
uh, purview of uh, the Health and Social Care Board uh, as well, um, and that's incorporated into the uh, the text I'll be bringing forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Uh, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I just want to point out to Councillor Farrell and other issues that we've agreed on this week. Um, just in terms of this, absolutely in full agreement with um, Councillor Farrell in terms of bringing this forward, and it is a really emotive issue. It's a really important issue for the city and district, and one that we have tried to get right over a number of years, but it, it, we haven't quite cracked it. And there are too many people out there at the minute who are very vulnerable and COVID has added to it. There is absolutely no doubt about it. So we need to be looking at what we can do. And we do have a commitment, a new decade, new approach that we need to explore further. I would just like to make a further suggestion, and, and that is that we reconvene the Civic Forum. Um, we have a number of partner agencies who sit on it. Um, they are involved in addiction services. They're involved in mental health services. They're involved in various um, voluntary bodies throughout our city and district. And I think it would be very important um, if we could reconvene that at this time as well, um, just to be looking at our own responsibilities and how we take them forward. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I would agree with this proposal as well from uh, Councillor Farrell. And I agree with what Councillor Duffy said there. We, we had actually talked about this in uh, the mental health working group there the other day. And thought that maybe as well, the Seamus had said the, the civic forum was probably the best idea to bring this forward on uh, for them to come in and uh, give a presentation to us all. Um, hopefully, when we all get back in the, the chamber again, it can be something that can be brought forward. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on this proposal? Chair Morris here, I'd indicated that to speak, can I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, Thank go you, ahead, Chair, Mark. for allowing me in. Uh, and look, DP has no problem uh, in supporting this proposal. I think it's very, very timely um, that we look for any help to do uh, in relation to addiction problems and mental health issues. And as we all know, um, we've been calling for this for a long time. But it's good to hear the information coming from the executive that there, that uh, it has been prioritised. That is welcome news, and we must keep the pressure on there through our MLAs um, who are there at the executive. And you know, I, I do agree that um, with the sentiments that COVID nineteen has exacerbated. Uh, um, this issue and that look and I do agree as well um, with the the previous speaker um, about the setting the meeting of the civic forum again to bring that all together and deal with it. No, hundred percent behind it, Chair. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you. Just to say that we fully support it, obviously. Um, it's something that the city and district has needed for a long time, and it's good that Councillor Darrell has highlighted to the fact that dual diagnosis is a part of this, uh, the amount of services that we have that people have been turned away because of the, the dual diagnosis. And I think anybody that listens to Tamsin's story about how she feels like if we had a detox centre, her mother would still be here, you know, could not, but try and lobby as much as we could to try and get one here in our city and district. So, fully behind this and, and will support this um, proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ferguson, I have no other indicated speakers and I would take this to be unanimous. Would I be right in saying that? So if anyone is speaking in a dollar wise, they let me know. No, everyone happy enough, unanimous then, proposed. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Oh, sorry, sorry. Rory, Rory, do you want to speak again, or are you...? I'm fine, Chair. I just put a wee okay. thank you under the chat box there. No, Mark, no, Mark. Uh, go ahead there, Councillor Ferguson. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Chair, this pandemic has been tough on us all, and I don't want this, what I'm about to bring up, to give a negative story about our young ones, our youth. They are suffering too. With many of them have lost their support networks and their ability to socialise. Over the last 12 months, we've seen a spike in antisocial behaviour, and our youths are gathering together and trying to find their new normal. 
villages and areas are struggling to engage them online and there's a real sense of digital fatigue. In my village over the weekend there we've seen parents coming to us about a group of teenagers gathering about 40 and 50 and, and we've, we've suspected that they're drinking and putting themselves into dangerous situations. We've had a fire by the train tracks and they've been gathering at old farm barns and multiple scenarios that are really worrying parents to think about. The community groups have tried to engage online and they're currently trying to get some of volunteers trained to engage them on the streets. Our wardens are out multiple times a day and night. The PS and I are being called numerous times and the community is at its wits end of what to do. We have thought of other ways that we can try and engage with the parents, but we really need the support of the EA and their intervention, intervention youth workers. I've been told that they've been stood down and that's worrying. I'm not advocating for a full return of services, but in areas that don't have the structure that some of our urban areas have with their youth workers and they do fantastic work, they really do. Some of the areas don't have that and we, they rely on the EA to step in in times of crisis with the youth. So I understand the minister is keeping his department safe, but I think with the intervention team that they need, they need to be able to come out when our youths need to be engaged and they should be designated as an essential service. So I would like to propose that we write to the Minister of Education and the EA expressing a need for street work, youth street on the street youth workers, and in particular, current with dealing with high level of antisocial behaviour and areas like our rural villages, which rely on the support of the EA. And we ask the minister to consider designating crisis interve and intervention youth workers as essential. I'm just going to pop that into the, the chat box now, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. I'll, well, I'll go on while you're putting that. How about a second, Chair? Sean, yeah, okay. No bother, Sean. Uh, Councillor Duffy, you want me to speak into this? Yeah, I, I do. It's a point of information for Rachel more than anything. I mean, like, I don't have an issue with, with writing a letter to the Education Minister, but there is provisions being made because we're working through those provisions locally in um, the Ballyarna DA. Um, there is provisions made for bespoke um, youth work, um, which is which is which includes on street. Um, there is a programme of work that weekly has to be sent through to EA for approval. Um, but work has certainly continued on street. We, we, we know that we had many issues over the summer, as you would have been aware of. And from that, we were able to carry out bespoke um, youth work on the street um, through EA. Um, it just needed to be approved weekly in terms of what the plans were. So maybe um, if, if that could be explored, Rachel, it, it might be an, an answer. Through the rural ones, unfortunately, it hasn't been able to be explored. Our youth workers here have tried to engage with the EA. Um, we have a EA community centre, which is always is currently trying to provide some training online for volunteers, but we haven't been able to get that bespoke package. And when I'm speaking with uh, youth workers there last week in Balmagorty, they have told me that they were um, said that they were to be stood down basically. So we have tried to do as much as we could through the bespoke avenue and through the community of workers which is why i'm asking to write for the intervention team which we had once a week uh, before the current lockdowns uh, on a wednesday night but we don't even have them at the moment okay councillor ferguson and councillor Duffy, thanks uh councillor edwards chair thanks for letting me in and i want to thank Councillor uh, Ferguson for bringing uh, this proposal and it's a big issue that the social behaviour is a massive issue um, probably across the entire district probably across the entire north but to put my own two cents in about the derg I met with uh, EA before Christmas and in fairness to them they have those workers going out in the Stravan town area and um, they're going out and they're, they're engaged with youth but there's no provision at all in the rural areas and myself and other their councillor and Alderman uh, Hussey there in particular, though, no, uh, we met with um, the police about antisocial behaviour in Castle and we're just sort of at our, at our what's the end to try and get something done about it. But uh, I have urged um, EA to get um, officers out into the rural areas to to engage with the, the youth, but nothing has happened as of yet. So I definitely fully support the proposal by Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Edwards, thank you. Uh, Alderman Hussey? Uh, thank you for allowing me in, Chair, and other members of this committee. Uh, totally support the proposal that's coming through from Councillor uh, Ferguson. 
uh, I think uh, Councillor Edwards has already uh, highlighted the point that what we're talking about here is more of a rural issue. I appreciate Councillor Duffy's point uh, that there are projects within the urban areas and of course within the urban areas there uh, is a greater capacity uh, with uh, voluntary community uh, workers uh, being employed in fact uh, in the urban areas as opposed to the dearth of provision within the rural area and indeed uh, Councillor Ferguson did refer there to wardens being out uh, I presume she's talking about the community safety wardens <laughs> remembering that we have uh, a very very limited access to the community warden community safety warden service uh, so any assistance of getting out there being on the street meeting these guys you know wherever they happen to be having a chat with them uh, and intervening uh, and then education uh, the AI itself uh, through its youth service, providing alternatives, you know, that that are applicable uh, during the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. Anything like that is to be welcomed, and I would thank uh, Rachel for bringing forward a very worthy proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, um, for allowing me in, uh, and I do agree um, with a lot of the sentiment that has been said previously um, and around the rural area, um, a rural area, uh, and many of us, uh, us, us rural uh, councillors or aldermen, always, uh, we have always this issue about parity between urban and rural, but I do believe uh, it's a good move um, writing to the, the Minister and the relevant authority, the EA, to get as much help as we can for the people out there, because in rural villages there is um, uh, growing issues out there, including antisocial behaviour, um, an increase probably in drink and drugs, uh, and that relates on then to quite a number of, of other issues. Uh, you know, uh, just to say, Chair, that I have no problem in supporting the the proposal. Okay, thank you, Alderman Devaney. Alderman Work. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just looking at that, just to, to clear something up, it's obviously the last line there. So, will be Rachel, it's more or less, see the youth workers at the minute, they are more or less essential. All youth workers are essential. And obviously, they're doing their best. But to be honest, looking at this, it's it's a problem what everybody's talking about now. It's more or less the difference between the urban and the rural. The EA is tasking youth workers to different areas now throughout the district obviously these areas but i think more or less on this here what needs to happen is contact the local ea so they can send the youth workers out because everybody's been trained in the youth sector now on the more or less to get out and deal with obviously issues out there um but it's just to clarify it um the youth workers are now frontline workers they're essential there and i know a lot of them in the district are doing amazing jobs there in the community. It's very hard at the moment, and it's obviously very challenging, challenging times for the young people. But they're out there. But the biggest thing it's obviously even before COVID here is obviously the support young people get in the in the rural areas. You know what I mean? It's obviously not enough, and that's something which we could be lobbying for as more youth sector provision put in the rural areas. And more or less, I said thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Work. Um, we have the. Let me see. Let me just go in maybe. Yeah, Rachel, you want to come back in there? Yeah, go ahead. Just wanted to respond to uh, Alderman Work. Absolutely, one hundred percent agree. Uh, did state that when I was speaking that the, the work that the youth workers are doing at the moment are fantastic, and I do see them as essential. It was just more of a policy side of things where we when. Um, we've been dealing with them through the safety forum, and the EA have been, the local EA have been in presence. They've been telling us that the minister has told them that they are not to be going out and interacting. And when we've asked them for different services, they've told us that they have to go through the policies that are coming down from the minister and the education authority. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ferguson, for that. I have no more indicated speakers with the proposal on the floor there. Is everyone happy enough with that? Again, if anyone isn't, just let me know.
And so it seems to be unanimous again. So proposal is through. Um, thank you for that there. Uh, Mr. Harkin is next. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, and can I just add to your previous points about uh, sending a message of solidarity to uh, council workers who were unfortunately attacked? Um, and uh, this is unacceptable. And I think once again, it puts uh, a spotlight on what it means to be in the front line. And uh, you know, for for policy makers and decision makers, uh, you know, this is why there has to be a great urgency in looking at how we. Uh, do across the board uplift for pay and conditions uh, for frontline workers um, because uh, I would I would imagine the average pay for uh, a frontline worker uh, with a council uh, that if you're an MP it's quadruple whatever it is for a council worker and that's just not an acceptable state of affairs. Um, but but uh, what I wanted to speak to is and I thanks chair for letting me in is um, I'm sure uh, everybody is now familiar with. Uh, uh, Gregory Campbell uh, MPs uh, racist statements and I think we should be collectively outraged that uh, that uh, uh, MP Campbell has decided that he is not to apologize for and he is now saying that he is uh, never said anything racist um, and uh, that he, what he said was fine and uh, I, I think that this is just incredible. I mean, when people of color are telling him this is racist, um, I don't think he's got a leg to stand on. Um, and I and I think we should join the Northwest Migrants Forum in um, uh, calling for uh, uh, Gregory Campbell to apologize uh, and calling for the DUP um, and uh, the House of Commons to hold um, the MP uh, responsible, accountable uh, for his words. Um, I think that that's what we need to be doing as a council. Just last month, we passed a motion here that received unanimous support, talking about standing up against racism and being a light in the darkness against discrimination. I think that this is what we should expect now from our council. Um, and um, I, I don't think we can just let this rest. Uh, and, and allow uh, allow people of color and everybody else who understands this dog whistle st style of politics uh, for what it was. Now, I mean, look, this is happening in a context where the number of hate crimes uh, reported here is going up, where we've just seen a nursing attack on the Belfast Multicultural Association Center. Um, that's the context that this is that this is happening in. And one of the things I think is, uh, you know, in in the Northwest Migrant Forum statement that thousands of people have signed, they said it's deeply worrying uh, that Mr. Campbell uh, can confidently display such uh, clear bias, apparently without fear uh, or accountability. Um, and this is, I think, very very important. I mean, what, why does he think he can say this and he won't be called to account? And I just want to point out that, like. Uh, you know, I've mentioned a few other things, but uh, you know, it's not that long since the the Black Lives Matter protests were um, uh, assaulted in this city and in Belfast. Um, and at that time, very very few people spoke out. Uh, many of the people right now who are condemning uh, 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 DUP uh, MP uh, Campbell uh, were silent uh, when the Black Lives Matter protests uh, were were uh, you know attacked in Derry and in Belfast and in fact they supported it. Sinn uh, Féin and the SDLP in particular were completely silent uh, and they've been very loud in their condemnations uh, of uh, Mr Campbell. So I would say um, the reason why uh, Mr Campbell believes he can get away with this is because of what happened in that day and the across the board support from the executive uh, for what happened to people of colour. So um, uh, we should urge, I urge everybody uh, to stand the Northwest Migrants Forum um, for accountability uh, from uh, the, the DUP MP. I would also call for the executive parties now to reflect on the Aren't fact uh, that they should, they should I will now, uh, that they should be calling for the fines and the prosecutions against the Black Lives Matter protest to be dropped immediately. And I also urge council now to bring forward the meeting 
that we've agreed to with the North Mass Migrants Forum and all our anti-racist campaign groups, that we bring that forward as quickly as possible, because it's, there's clearly a need for a discussion about what racism is and what we can do to actually stand up against it. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Harkin. Thank you. Uh, I have a number of speakers indicated on this, and that is Councillor Duffy, first there. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And I'd, when I put my name in the, the chat box, I thought that it was actually um, something that I was going to wholeheartedly support. But I am going to wholeheartedly support it. But I want to say just in response to some of Councillor Harkin's rewriting of history, Sinn Féin spoke out very much around the Black Lives Matters protests. We we raised it at PCSP meetings, we raised it at private meetings with the police, we raised it publicly, and we voted in favour of the motion that you brought before this council in support of Black Lives Matters and in support of the dropping of fines. So, honestly, um, Councillor Harkin, you're rewriting history again, but in terms of the issue at hand, absolutely no problem in supporting the, the proposal. Um, the comments of um, Dr. Campbell were absolutely disgusting. They were racist to their core and no matter what Gregory Campbell tries to say that it was not racist it was absolutely racist everything about it screamed racism I also have signed the letter um, of support from the Northwest Migrants Forum and I know that uh, quite a number of my party colleagues have also so happy to support this but I, I would ask Councillor Harkin to reflect on his rewriting of history Okay, thank you Councillor Duffy uh... Uh, yes, Chair, thanks for bringing me in. And can I, I find myself in total agreement with the uh, previous speaker, Councillor Duffy, um, when Councillor Harkin started speaking about the comments in relation to Gregory Campbell MP, uh, our party was in full agreement with his comments in that respect. Uh, we have uh, we, we have made our calls on Gregory Campbell to to apologise for what he has said uh, when he didn't apologise, but in fact doubled down on his uh, his comments. Uh, we've also called for uh, the wider DUP party to, to, to consider his comments. And uh, indeed, I know it's been reported to the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner, so we, we let that take its course. Um, but then towards the end, uh, as Councillor Duffley has outlined, Councillor Harkin, Goes on and uh, and uses language that is totally wrong. Uh, you know, it, it's strange that he he talks about uh, the the importance of Gregory Campbell and how he should uh, you know reflect on his words and his comments. But then, in the same breath, uh, totally rewrites what happened in the summer uh, when this item uh, was raised at that time. Party uh, supported the motion that he brought. Uh, so he says that we were silent on it. That is patently untrue. Uh, party leader Colin Eastwood was on Radio Foil uh, the very next day uh, in relation to the issues uh, that, that, that had been raised. Uh, we raised them with the police at the most senior level. And indeed, as Councillor Duffy's indicated, they were raised with police locally in the PCSP. Uh, so for Councillor Harkin to somehow project that uh, that every other party were silent on the issues is just totally inaccurate, Chair. Um, but on, on the issue that he raised at the start, uh, we were uh, you know, quite happy to endorse the comments that he made in relation to uh, the, the comments by Gregory Campbell. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, um, for allowing me in uh, on this issue. And Look, I just want to put it on record that the DUP party uh, is not a, a racist party. And at the end of the day, um, this issue, uh, I know people uh, is clearly um, calling for this issue to be brought to the fore, but uh, our party leader has been very much to the fore. Uh, and our actual wording is that these are sentiments that she would not identify with. And, you know, uh, and she, she said she really enjoys um, songs of praise. Uh, and really, I do enjoy it as well. Music in it uh, is wonderful. But I have to say, I do agree with some of the rest of the speakers here that um, when um, Councillor Harkin speaks on an issue, there's about six different issues he comes in. Uh, and he is totally, tr as Councillor Duffy has tried to say, or did state, that he is trying to 
rewrite uh, um, history and what happened over the summer um, regarding the Black Lives Matter. And look, uh, at the end of the day, uh, our party supports equality and fair play for everyone. We stated that very, very clearly at the Black Lives Matter uh, issue, and we condemned the, the acts of violence that were carried out during those protests, and that fact still remains, and the fact still remains today that those issues, that, that we are a fair party, an, an equitable party um, for fairness, for no matter what race, colour or religion you are. And thank you, Chair. Chairman uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I'm happy to support the proposal. Um, I agree entirely. Words do matter and the way in context you, you say them does have an impact on the rest of our society and the words of uh, Gregory Campbell were racist and I agree with, I have signed the the petition um, with the Northwest Migrants. I also know that the, there's an education in the sense that needs to be highlighted here. We want to work with the Northwest Migrants Forum. Our party has interacted with a lot of the BME activists online and we've actually taken an internal um, diversity polling and trying to do better in all aspects. So I think words and actions do matter. So I'm happy to um, completely support this motion. I'm not going to get into the, the rest of it because I don't want to go for a tit for tat. I, I want to focus on the matter at hand, which is supporting the Northwest Migrants Forum and the petition and getting the the outcomes that they want, which is an apology and for the DUP and Gregory Campbell, they acknowledge that it was racist. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Um, I know all our indicated speakers on that. Um, so, we'll just, Councillor Harkin, uh, have you an actual proposal there, or is it just the support, the, yeah. the act, the, you know, the, the petition that was going? Yeah, Chair, I'm not, I'm not writing up a uh, yeah. proposal because. Uh, there is a petition that was mentioned there. I encourage people who haven't signed it to, to sign it. Uh, we are going to have a uh, council meeting with the Northwest Migrant yeah. Forum and others, and I think that that would have been a proposal otherwise. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to hear so many people are, uh, you know, agreeing with the call for accountability. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Hargan. And I, I would back calls. I uh, think that the, the remarks were totally inappropriate. Um, and I would obviously distance myself from that sort of uh, language uh, at any time. Uh, so we'll move on to the next uh, matters arising. Sure. Older, older man work. It's just a quick one. All right. Was this on? Sorry. Was this on on uh, what Councillor Harkin spoke about, or was it? No, it's, it's reference uh, Councillor Ferguson's one. It's just see the community wardens references Strathfoyle. Could we obviously contact the, the the PCSP and have the community wardens there? I had a, a phone call with a youth worker there, and they feel it'd be ideal to get the community wardens in that area too to help yeah. support. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, sure. Alderman Mark, for that. Um, Chair, can I just clarify the community wardens are out nearly on a daily basis with us at the moment and they're they're actively coming out and dealing with a lot of it. They they've been out in the past um I think three or two, four times the last couple of days. So they are out here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Um on matters arising, uh Count or Alderman Hussey. Uh thank you, Chair. I, I feel I have to just say with uh, on the back of the community safety wardens. Uh, if you can get them out to the Derek, they'll be very welcome there too. That's a matter for PCSP. Uh, on the uh, item with regard to playing pitch strategy, I suppose this is in, in Barry's uh, bailiwick. Um, at the last meeting, uh, the committee received the report um, within what it was protect, uh, enhance and provide. And a uh, matter of concern there within itself 2.3 was the adequacy of private club pitches but section 4 in that report also outlined uh, that no budget had been confirmed now contained within the the 
uh, appendix is the recommendations for capital investment program for clubs. And I, I noticed there, you know, up to 50,000 per year, uh, five clubs could claim up to 50,000 per year. Per year. So, so clarification, is that 50,000 for five clubs or is that 250,000 uh, would be the spend and, you know, maybe uh, it could be 10 clubs coming in at 25,000. So that's the first question. Uh, and council are prepared to work with high profile clubs. Could high profile clubs be defined? And when is it, you know, uh, the point was made that there's no budget confirmed. Is it envisaged that a budget will be confirmed for this? And when will clubs be able to uh, engage with council officers around the proposed funding that might be available? Thank you. The Alderman Hussey. Um, is Barry there? Yeah, I can come in, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose this is one of the high level strategic recommendations. And what the suggestion is, Alderman Hussey, is that there would be a budget of 250,000 and that, that up to five clubs could get a maximum of five uh, or of 50,000 pounds. Apologies. So, look, yeah, that could be made up of, of 10 clubs or three clubs getting 25,000. But what, what the suggestion is, is that you would get up to a maximum of 50,000 pounds. But that we would get into that detail if there was a detailed criteria and that would be presented in front of members. The the recommendation in terms of addressing issues around private clubs is that council would have a grant aid programme like this, similar to what the former Strabane District Council had and many years ago Derry City Council had. But in terms of your question around budget, no, um, any of the detailed recommendations will first come in front of Capital Working Group and outside of what we've agreed to date, throughout leisure underspends to spend some essential maintenance works on our pitches. There is no identified budget. So that would be a matter for members to prioritize going forward around capital spend or rates investment in terms of if and when money became available. So that's something that we can present to members through capital working group and then through council accordingly. But though those budget discussions will have to be approved um, by members and discussions with the lead finance officer where that money would be found. It would have to be council money and there would be an implication of, of exactly where it would be coming from. Uh, Chair, just, just to follow up to that then, is the bid within the current rates budget considerations? For yourself, Chair, no, it's not. It's not. There's no, none of those. The, the only spend to date is the enhancement of our existing facilities that we presented in the last number of months around pits maintenance, change of facilities, storage, early drain, and all of that. And, and all of that work is ongoing. So all of these key strategic recommendations will be for a future date once we have them all fully costed. Once the public consultation around the strategy is complete and we can take time to gather all of the relevant information around that. A final observation, Chair, and thank you for your uh, forbearance. Saying then that the strategy teams will not kick in or may not kick in until uh, April, March, April, two thousand and twenty-two. Yes, Chair, that's correct. At the earliest, yes, members. Again, a decision for members in terms of um, identifying the budget and providing the the required budget around the the key strategic recommendations. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that, Barry. Uh, and Alderman Hussey, uh, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I want to uh, raise a matter under HC uh, 1321. Um, it is the only place where um, we had decided that this could be uh, they brought in. It's about walkways and the it's the lighting of the walkway at the foil embankment from the stretch between Craig Avon Bridge and I suppose caution initially, but I would be saying uh, beyond that too as well. Um, we have seen and it is widely welcomed that there is a lot of people out walking um, and I have been contacted by uh, a large number of people regarding the no lights uh, at this uh, walkway. 
Um, I feel it as a health and safety issue, um, and we we really need to, um, I think, push to get lights in this area sooner uh, rather than later. Um, so I would be very grateful if the council officers could take that on board and maybe put it to a relevant um, department to see if that could be moved on. Um, I, I bring it up here in health and communities because it is a health matter. Um, we do welcome people out walking, but uh, as I said, there is a safety issue there as well. And the mayor himself has uh, had a statement out uh, regarding the congestion um, around the, the walkers down at the, the quay. So we really need to be uh, weighing in choices. Uh, for people, but those areas need to be safe. So I would be very grateful if that could be progressed as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lowe. Um, does anyone like Karen? Do you want to? Um, yeah, yes, Chair, we'll take that on board and have some discussions with our ENR colleagues on that matter. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Farrell? It, it's Groundhog Day again. So I'm going to raise HC21, which is about uh, the mobile masts at, at Karen Hall and Strand Road. And I've asked at every committee whether or not they've been tested. Um, so I'm asking again, are we aware whether Ofcom have, have tested uh, the one at Karen Hall or the one at Strand Road. Thank you. Through you, Chair, it's uh, Seamus here. I can provide an update to Councillor Farrell. To date, we haven't received any reports in relation to monitoring data at those two sites. We have uh, issued correspondence to Ofcom just in relation to when that's going to be provided. And when we are in receipt, we'll provide that information to committee. What I would say is we've received information today in relation to uh, an event organised by NILGA, which is to take place on the 4th of March at 10.30 a.m. And that's uh, a member briefing in relation to 5G. And that information will be circulated shortly to members. Okay. Thanks, Sheila, for that. Uh, Go ahead there, Councillor Collicker. Yeah, Chair, sorry, I'm just putting in. Just, just for information purposes, that has been circulated, that, that invite that Seamus is talking about. So it's, uh, it's in your inbox. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Harkin. Yes, Chair, thanks. Uh, just two issues on work workers' rights on, uh, on HC1721. The first is, uh, you know, I, I, I think we've talked a lot in our council about our supports for workers' rights and, and social justice and trade unions. Um, and, I, and I just want to make note that I think it was very disappointing the way that um, port workers uh, and their trade unions have been treated. Uh, you know, from early February when they were withdrawn uh, from work on the basis that uh, supposedly trade unions had uh, said that there was a threat when trade unions have, did not say that was the case. Um, and I think that this is a situation where people are trying to use trade unions um, and workers really as, as pawns. Um, so that was very disappointing. Uh, and I think that, that uh, you know, we, we should be on record uh, saying that. Um, the second point is, it's a health and safety issue for workers here in our district. Um, I've been contacted by uh, quite a few workers at uh, Seagate. And as people know, Seagate is a, a very important and uh, major employer in our area. Uh, a lot of people work there. Um, and uh, it's a company that's actually seen its shares go up during the pandemic in terms of their, their value. So because uh, Seagate workers have worked right through the pandemic. Uh, they're, they're listed as essential workers. Um, and I, I would request that we, as the health committee, write to Seagate management 
uh, asking for clarification on workers' uh, ability to access the company uh, sick pay when they're self-isolating. Okay, Kurt Stahargan, is that a proposal there? Yep. What, what I am being told is that uh, workers are, are having great difficulty when they're self-isolating, accessing the sick pay, which is putting pressure on people to come into work uh, when they probably shouldn't. Um, and uh, you know, we're, this is in a context now where people are being told you could face 10 years in jail if you breach guidelines. So this is a serious matter, as is any kind of laxity on uh, guidelines, uh, uh, you know, safety guidelines at work. So, you know, I, I think we should, um, uh, you, you know, the workers there don't have a recognized union, uh, so they're not able to kind of uh, have a discussion with a company uh, on an equal basis uh, on this. So I, I think um, uh, we, we should put in a letter to uh, management asking for clarification on those issues, and I'll be happy to uh, post that proposal in right now. Have you a seconder for that there? I second it. Okay, thanks. Is that Councillor Duffy? Yeah. Would anyone like to speak on this, or are we all happy enough on it? Can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I just not aware of the issue. Um, I I know that quite recently I've had a friend request from what I believe to be probably a Seagate employee, um, where issues are being raised, but nothing has been raised with me directly, so I'm not over the issue. I'm not a hundred percent, but the letter is just seeking clarity, so. I'm happy to second it um, for further information to be brought forward. Okay. Um, I've no other. I'm the chair chair. Morris here. Yep. Just, Go ahead. Look, Go I, ahead. I'm, I totally agree with the sentiments of the letter. Uh, if there are concerns within the workplace um, regarding those that are uh, in isolation, uh, if they're not able to get on the sick pay, uh, it does cause um, financial hardships. And we have no. Uh, I have no problem, our party has no problem uh, in supporting, um, asking for information on this from Seagate. Thanks, Chair. Alderman Devaney. Um, no or indicated speakers here, so it would take, if no one wants to let me know, I'll take it as unanimous again. I myself have been contacted probably by the same person as Councillor Duffy um, and Councillor Doyle and so that's the only way I've been made aware of it. I was always the under the understanding that at the very beginning of this pandemic that Boris had stated that no one was to be in any business at all. Anyone that was a warning or anything that got pending was to have this looked as a separate, a completely separate time of sickness period from work. Everyone happy enough that there, so it's proposed. So I've no other indicated speakers, so we'll move on now to item eight, uh, hardship fund. So Una, if you would like to. Thanks very much, Chair. And this report, as you can see, the detail and um, I'll do my best to take you through key points in relationship rather than every specific aspect, um, something that everybody has read of now in detail. Um, members at the outset just really want to put our, our um, record our thanks to the members of the Welfare Reform Working Group who have met on a number of occasions in order to consider um, the best way forward for the hardship fund. And um, you may recall back in December, it was agreed that we would allocate £50,000. And at that time, we were looking to support the Salvation Army and St. Vincent de Paul joint campaign. We allocated £15,000 to that campaign and we ring fenced the remaining £35,000 um, that would go towards stage two of the hardship fund. And um, stage two members just 
for your own background information was really for us to seek a partnership um, with another organisation or number of organisations that would help us to raise money and go towards key priorities for those in greatest need. Um, and members, whenever they were considering um, the best way to take forward stage two, determined that they needed more information, really in terms of understanding the level of need and the level of support that was out there. And in doing so, they then therefore recommended that, that given there was a timeline timeline with the £35,000, that they would look at other immediate priorities with relation to you can see that in section um, 2.3, um, we set out what um, those priorities were um, and that the members, in addition to um, looking at the work of the Welfare Reform Working Group, also had a presentation from Joseph Rowntree Foundation, um, who really drew our attention to the greatest needs at the minute in terms of the working poor. And so whenever members um, have identified, whether it be um, food poverty, digital connectivity, poverty, fuel poverty, the bottom line is that it's poverty. Um, it's poverty for a large number of people um, within our council area. Um, and at the time of writing the report, members, again, just want to draw your attention that we had a couple of very quick meetings um, that it hadn't been possible to get all the information together in order to put this report into committee. And therefore, in some of the sections, I'll give you a verbal update um, and I hope that you'll be able to um, accept that as we move our way forward in relation to it. Um, and also members, um, the Welfare Reform Working Group, whilst making these recommendations with respect to the £35,000, um, are very much committed to stage two of the hardship um, fund. They still want to progress with a separate fund and um, that will be subject to separate reports um, that will come before committee at a later stage. Member, um, section three gives you some context in terms of key issues and um, I'm sure many of you would have um, received the presentation from DFC that um, had given us some of the very alarming figures in relation to poverty within our council area. And then as it referenced, um, we also received just last week a presentation from the Joseph Rowntree um, Foundation for the um, Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group, which really looked at um, poverty in a COVID situation because a lot of the data exist now pre-COVID um, and what they're finding is that there are particular sectors that are hardest hit um, and there are particular um, individuals um, come from particular sectors, whether that be low pay sectors, um, minority ethnic groups and lone parents who are struggling more so than some of the others um, in respect to the current situation that we find ourselves in. Um, at that particular meeting, we had representatives um, from local growth partnerships. We had Advice Centre, we had um, the Dairy Credit Union and a number of other organisations um, representing women and ethnic minorities. And they told a very similar story in terms of need um, within our local community at the minute. And the advice services in particular have been able to identify the level of increase in client referrals um, that they have received um, and the additional support orders that they have been providing have really been used to the maximum um, with respect to the support that has been provided by DFC. Um, there was some concern, members, as you would imagine, with the draft budget um, that has been presented by DFC, that the implications in terms of advice service orders going forward, and they accepted that whilst this is in draft format at this stage, that it was something that they were mindful of in terms of drawing attention um, to members within that meeting. Um, members also within the meeting, um, it was very much looking at what immediate support can be provided. Um, and a lot of that immediate support, as you know, is being provided at this moment in time by DFC, who have given considerable resources, um, not only to local growth partnerships, but also in terms of regional um, charities and regional organisations. Um, and despite that support, um, there still continues to be a level of unfulfilled need. Um, and what the members of the Welfare Reform Working Group asked us to do as an officer team was to go back and see if we could um, potentially identify and quantify that need some more in terms of making recommendations here today in terms of um, committee. Um, in terms of um, taking forward um, these recommendations, I want just to take you through some of the um, key points in relation to each of them. So 
with respect to the food poverty, um, and as you know, members, um, quite a lot of money um, and support has been given to food poverty. Um, and despite that, um, the um, growth partnerships and also the food banks have indicated that the level of demand has exceeded um, the supply that has come forward. Um, and in completing this table um, at the time of writing the report, um, whilst the food banks had indicated an amount of money, um, they've since come back to say that um, for foil food bank, £10,000 would support 420 households. Um, Strabane Food Bank, um, £800 would support between 50 to 60 households, depending on the level of support that was given. And the Church's Trust, um, the 2,160 would support 130 households. Um, members, this really is exemplified by the Foil Food Bank, um, who indicated that originally they had anticipated 90 referrals coming from the local growth partnerships, but on average now we're receiving 340 referrals, which is in addition to the 80 referrals from other sources. So members from the Welfare Reform Working Group were satisfied that there was clearly an identified need that they want to make a recommendation in terms of providing additional financial support to these three organisations. Members, whenever it came to the discussion on fuel poverty, um, again, some members had indicated that there had been an indication um, that there was still a need with respect to fuel. Um, and there was a reference made um, in particular to the rural areas. So officers undertook to take some further um, investigation in relation to this. Um, members, what we were attempting to do as an officer team was to estimate the approximate number of people who have currently accessed support, whether that be from the DFC support administered through the neighbourhood partnership boards and the local growth partnerships, or whether it be the Bryson Energy um, and the St Vincent de Paul money that we had also provided, and also other local charities, because there are quite a number of other charities, um, such as Child and Straban, who have been providing this type of support um, to local people. And at the same time, to identify a proxy um, indicator members that would give us some level of understanding in terms of need. Members, at this point, we do not have sufficient information in order to give a level of quantification in terms of need. Um, and we needed that level of quantification in order to be able to make a recommendation in terms of a sum of money that would meet audit requirements. And therefore, members, um, without having that level of detail, we're unable to provide that recommendation. Members, with respect to the advice hours, um, again, as you can see here, um, we were provided with information from the three advice centres in terms of the level of um, inquiries that they're currently receiving, um, and also that the um, indication would be that the 20 advisors could provide those additional hours in April. Um, and you can see the detail in terms of the three organisations um, and how that that would be divided. Um, members, these um, are in addition to what would currently be provided by DFC in terms of their normal support. Um, and that's really in recognition of the number of people that are requiring wraparound services and the number of people who've never potentially accessed support before. Um, and the numbers of people who were unaware of the type of support that they were available or that they could actually access. Members, the third, fourth area that um, we were asked to look at was respect. To and this really focused um, particularly within the rural DEAs, um, where it was recognised um, that there are a considerable number of our young people who do not go to schools, post-primary schools within our council area. Um, and at the time of writing the report, we were able to give you an example of the Sacred Heart College in Oma, who have approximately 100 um, people, um, young people from Simon Mills, Castledare, Newton Stewart and Douglas Bridge. Members, since completing this report, we now um, understand that there's almost 600 young people that go to all of the different schools um, within the OMA um, area, and that's just within the OMA um, area that we've been able to identify. That's not taken in, for example, Limavati and other areas, but we wanted to give you the sense of scale. So despite um, £12,000 being previously been allocated from um, the DFC funding, there's clearly an unmet need in relation to this. Um, members, it's proposed that £10,000 will be allocated to each of the three 
DEA, rural DEA areas, um, and that members would um, approximately support um, 85 young people. And members, if you were just to look solely at those young people that go to the OMA um, schools, um, that would equate to almost 14% of them um, would be eligible or would be able to support with respect um, to digital connectivity. Um, we have been also asked to explore the possibility of purchasing broadband vouchers. Um, however, again, at this stage, um, we have been unable to determine the extent of this need and the variations in packages members between contracts and pay as you go options um, that it just wasn't feasible um, to put forward a recommendation in relation to that. Members, the next two items, um, the first one is in relation to training, and that's recognising that there's a huge um, volume of support that's currently available to people in hardship, but often um, those in terms of the first point of contact may not necessarily be aware of those. So if um, it was a housing officer, maybe a social worker, um, may may not know the full range of benefits or the full range in terms of community based support that's available. And therefore, it's proposed that we would design um, a training program that would target 30 um, people who are currently working at a front line that would maybe be the first point of contact for people in hardship and that they would be able to do that kind of cross referral. Um, members, given that this very much is seen as being um, statutory responsibility also, that we would look to see if we could partner with um, a statutory um, organisation in terms of taking this forward. Members, the final area um, is the evaluation, um, and this is considered to be a really key aspect in terms of the work of the stage to hardship fund. Um, we know undoubtedly that there's a huge level of need um, within our local council area. Unfortunately, we don't have the full access to data in terms of what currently is being provided, whether that be from government, whether that be from statutory or whether that be from private. And this piece of work is really looking to establish that level of support that's currently available that would help us to identify where potentially that there may be gaps. Um, and that's where the stage two hardship fund should focus it on. Um, where there's an over demand or potentially an under demand for support. And therefore, we could maybe lobby um, respect to statutory agencies in terms of reallocating um, any particular support. So it's considered to be a very, very important piece of work that would um, help to inform the scope and the focus of the um, stage two hardship. Members, this next table then really is a summary in terms of the recommendations um, with respect to each of the areas. Um, and St. Vincent de Paul also um, had advised us members the £15,000 that they had been allocated whilst they have now allocated that full £15,000 that they need a bit more time in terms of being able to submit their final claims. And so they've asked for that extension until the end of March. And from an officer perspective, um, members were satisfied that the system that they require for the drawdown of funding would meet council's audit requirements and therefore were happy to recommend it. Members, um, in addition to um, those recommendations that came forward um, from the Welfare Reform Working Group, they also had indicated, and um, apologies for this because it's not in the written report, um, it was just in terms of reflecting on, on the basis of all of the notes that we have gathered in relation to those discussions, that members of the Welfare Reform Working Group had also suggested that we would write to the Northern Ireland Executive and should there be additional money left over in terms of uncommitted funds that maybe um, the Northern Ireland Executive would consider um, allocating that towards a hardship fund and that they would work with us in terms of the stage two process and being able to help to identify what those priorities are. Um, and therefore members were also asking to include that as part of this report. Members, with respect to the financial equality, legal HR improvement and rural needs implications, um, you can see the conversations have taken place with the head of um, finance and also um, that we have um, asked for approval with respect to this sum of money. Um, members, at £73,430, which is an addition to the £15,000 that has been previously allocated. Um, the Head of Finance has indicated um, that this sum of money is available and can be accommodated through savings in community services budget and associated DFC financial loss. 
um, claims um, in terms of the equality screening exercise members. This has previously been completed um, for the um, FC funding um, and these key areas that we're looking to allocate across also are consistent in relation to that and we're satisfied that all screening issues have been dealt with and therefore have been screened out. Um, members have also um, identified a particular rural issue um, with respect to digital technology um, and you can see that we have um, made a recommendation for the three rural DAs that they would, provide, would be provided with support in relation to digital connectivity um, and that we would look to support um, rural young people um, who are currently living outside or sorry, living within the council area but who attend schools outside of the council area. And therefore, members, I'm happy to take any comments or any queries that you have in relation to this report. We're recommending the following sums of money that have been identified under 5.1 of the report. Um, we're asking that St. Vincent de Paul is given an extension for their expenditure to the end of March. Um, and we're also asking for your approval that we would write to the Northern Ireland Executive asking them to identify any understands that they may have in the budget that will be um, directed towards um, stage two of our hardship fund. So thank you, Chair, and um, that's the report now presented. Thank you, Una, for that uh, very detailed report. And uh, as Chair of the group, I would just like to say as well, thank you for all that work and effort that you've put under this in such a short space of time. Uh, it's, it's very heartening that, uh, yeah, no, that we have a, a team at the, no, along with yourself that's able to pull this stuff out of the air for us, uh, and we're really appreciative of it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Burke is looking in there. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Anna, for the presentation. Um, and just to echo, obviously, Darren's comments. I know timing was tight, and I'd just like to thanks for pulling the report as quick together as you said. Um, obviously, following the welfare group meetings, and now they're getting time to digest the report in full. I do just have a few queries. Um, it's firstly, it's just there are only really three here. For firstly, in, in relation to the you know, the external synopsis or research piece that we're looking at for stage two, um, can I just ask where that sits? Firstly, in relation to you know the work that's going to be undertaken as part of the DFC anti poverty strategy and the advisory panel group that's been set up and the research they'll be carrying out. And then obviously we have some local pieces of research that have been done to date. I know of one of a worker from the outer north around poverty. Will, will these be considered you know, within the research or as part of it, just so we're not duplicating what has been done or is to be done? Um, also, um, it's my understanding that just see the synopsis, it'll present an analysis. I just want to con confirm this. It's going to present an analysis of the level of poverty and then obviously the support available. And as you said in that, where we can then use the hardship fund too to identify potential gaps. Um, so will this take into account um, areas such as education under attainment, low level employment, et cetera, everything that ties into poverty and hardship and the economic inactivity of their Instagram. So I just want to check, will this all be considered? And then finally, can I ask, um, and I'm asking this for a reason. Is is it possible for the external synopsis or indeed elements of it to be compiled at any point in house by officers? Would the resources be there, or if there's potential savings in other areas of funding? And I'm asking that um, because following the last obviously welfare meeting we had, I was made aware of an approach to the the our own party by job directions in Stravan through our councillor Michaela Boyle. So job directions would fall under the the NEEC program. So they're outside of the education remit. And would be a sector that to an extent have been got, forgotten throughout the pandemic. They have asked her around assistance for with computer hardware for um, their essential skills and qualifications training, because under normal circumstances, they would be in buildings using facilities, but with restrictions and guidelines, this obviously hasn't been possible. So if we were able to save some money in elements of this funding by moving on house where appropriate, could this be directed towards this type of project? Or indeed, is there some uh, additional funding which could be made available just to alleviate some of the pressures they are dealing with? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Burke. I'll, and I'll let you come back in on that there because there's a few questions there. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Burke. Um, in relation to the synopsis, um, most recently I've spoken to DFC and the lead policy officer um, looking after that at the beginning of this week. Um, and he has indicated that whilst um, they have completed the expert panel report, it's currently with the Minister for Consideration. Um, they are 
fairly confident that they're going to keep to their original timeline, which would indicate that their report will be ready for December of this year. Um, it's not their intention to do that detailed synopsis um, because that was one of the questions that I had for him was um, does this information already exist and can we actually um, access their information rather than trying to repeat it. So unfortunately it doesn't exist um, and this um, work will be detailed obviously to our local council area rather than across the council area but very happy to work with us in terms of providing us with whatever information they have access to in terms of statistics and so forth in relation to that. Um, so very conscious of the DSC anti-poverty report and obviously want to make sure that we're aligned as far as possible in relation to that and also working alongside that. Um, but obviously our piece of work will be completed in advance of that. And ideally that piece of work should be able to influence DSC in terms of then whenever it will come to um, the consultation process, because we have a piece of evaluation or a piece of analysis that would be very much bespoke to our council. Um, which will be very important. Um, absolutely, um, we would not want to duplicate anything that's already there. So um, any information that um, members are aware of that has been collated, obviously, as an officer team, we are aware of some of it. Um, wouldn't say that we have um, a full um, overview of everything. So please let us know anything that you do know of um, and that you're aware of um, and that we would include that. In terms of um, the educational attainment and all of those other aspects, as we all know, um, poverty is so multi-dimensional. Um, it's not one thing that leads to somebody um, being in poverty. So the first part of the report really is giving us an overall context of poverty um, and looking at the key indicators of poverty. It'll not drill down specifically to any one of those individually. Um, that would be a very, very detailed piece of work um, and would be outside of the time scale that we have in terms of this piece of work. However, um, we're also within an officer team very aware of the work that's going to be do, um, undertaken in terms of the labour market partnership that's going to be set up and the social clauses work that's going to be set up and obviously the work that we're doing from an anti-poverty um, working group. So, Councillor Burke, we've tried to bring all of those different pieces of work together that would help to inform the overall um, detail of the report. And um, given the fact, again, that um, it's so comprehensive or has the potential to be so comprehensive that where possible, we will do as much in-house work um, and reduce the costs um, in terms of looking out to an external partner to work with us in relation to that. Um, for the job directions, um, the NEAP programme, um, I suppose at this stage, all we can really do is signpost. Um, and you may be aware of the project that um, Owen Barr has been um, organising with the um, reuse, new to you centre, the four hours, um, which is asking for the donations of old hardware. Um, they've got considerable donations that have come forward. Now, obviously, there's considerable demand, but we would ask them to consider um, this um, particular referral as well whenever they're um, looking at those um, in need, if that's helpful. Anna, thank you for that. Um, Alderman Devenny. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And first of all, I want to commend Una and the team for the the piece of work that they've done here, they've turned it around very, very quickly. And as she has identified, there there was a number of meetings by the by the group. And look, I, I think uh, coming from all members of the group, um, we, we were really targeting at those areas where the, where we could see there were gaps. And look, we had thirty five thousand pounds to spend, and we had to get it spent probably best before the end of the year. So. We, we really drilled down uh, into a number of issues from a number of members who were on the committee and the officers took that away and analysed it and brought it back. And I have to say, uh, um, I commend them on the piece of work. Um, we looked at food and you see that's clearly identified there. Um, probably the only one was um, fuel. Um, hasn't been identified yet, especially for fuel, need, fuel poverty in the rural area but maybe that could, could be identified later on. And then we looked uh, at the, the, the digital end um, with our schools now, minimum homeschooling and stuff like that there, and to look at, at ways and means uh, of enhancing the, 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 the homeschooling by buying maybe iPads or pads, tablets of some kind. 
And then one thing we did hone in as well very much on, Chair, as you know, was the, the 1.5 million cut in services to the advice services. And what I would say, Chair, I do welcome the money that has been forwarded here for the advice services because they will be the frontline services as you know, COVID moves in uh, uh, and, you know, when we come out of the furlough scheme and stuff like that there, and they will be the frontline services for those people who are in poverty, no matter what name you put forward, should it be food, fuel, or whatever it might be. And look, I, I do understand as well the training issue. Um, it's good to see that on there. And the evaluation, really the evaluation, Chair, as you know, uh, as chairing the meeting is for to really look at the hardship fund and the bigger picture and around all the hardship need and around there. And I do welcome that £9,000. And I would I have no problem uh, in supporting the extension to um, St Vincent de Paul and supporting the writing to the, the Northern Ireland Executive for to, if there was any funding to help with the hardship fund. And Chair, it gives me great pleasure to propose this um, recommendation coming forward here today. So I'd make that a proposal. And once again, Thanks to Una and the team for a superb piece of work. And look, as I said before, we looked at gaps and you could look at the amount of money here. Probably some people would say it isn't enough, but we have an amount of money here. And when we started off with 35,000, we're well into 70,000 here, which is welcome. I think we discussed that chair very detailed at the, but well done to Una and the team. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Uh and that's proposed and seconded by Alderman Burke. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. And first, can I start off by declaring an interest being a uh, member of the Falkland Growth Partnership. I just want to say thank you to Anna, Karen and Susan and the rest of the team. I mean, this was intense. It was literally, um, we had £35,000. We were looking at uh, a presentation from the Joseph Rowntree and, and the Stark figures, and, and we were trying to find a way that this was most impactful. We, we didn't want to necessarily just put it into one pot um, and you went away and you have come back not only with 35,000 but you've been able to bring in 73,000 back with um, a, a number of different things on it you know the food poverty everything was taken into consideration I'm really pleased that the Churches Trust were uh, contacted and and they've now been included in this too it's fantastic the food, fuel poverty understandable it was a big uh, ask for such a I think it was 48 hour turnaround so uh, I know that's something that we will possibly look at through the, the second stage of the, the working group. Um, the advice services, it's it's well needed. It's been well versed in this meeting. You know, it's something that is really, really needed in this area. And I personally have seen a higher level of referrals and 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 the, the work that they do, they're like magicians, they're able to find, you know, uh, answers for people that you wouldn't necessarily think was there. The digital poverty, again, another great one. The broadband vouchers, Again, the same thing. In 48 hours, you weren't going to be able to find a solution for pay and go and broadband and, and digital um, hotspots. And, you know, it's something that we can work on going forward in the next. The training is going to be really impactful. Having those amount of people have even the, the entry level of knowledge on, on um, what kind of benefits are out there and what people can access is, is going to be really great. And the evaluation is going to be uh, what we need ourselves as a working group and as a council to lobby going forward so it's all amazing and and i'm happy to also um support the extension to st vincent de paul and i just want to put on record that you know and uh, karen susan the, the whole team you have done absolutely fantastic and especially trying to get us all together in a very short periods of time so thank you very much sir ferguson uh alderman Hussey. Thank you, Chair, and like others, uh, you know, uh, thanks for a tremendous piece of work, uh, particularly in what is a, clearly a very fluid situation. Uh, you know, so e even the report that you that you have there uh, had to be updated given the fluidity of, of what you're dealing with. Uh, you will understand that I particularly welcome 3.9 with uh, the recognition of the tremendous number of students from the Derg area in particular, uh, who, and the, there's areas of Spurn as well, Plum Bridge, etc., uh, who will go to school in Oma. Uh, 100 from Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart 
to my mind, uh, thinking on it would probably be one of the smaller uh, intakes from the dairy area. So if it's sitting at 100, I would think your, your 600 uh, would be a, an underestimate. I'm mindful of Loretta Convent, uh, Christian Brothers, Drumra Integrated, Oma Academy, Oma High Indeed, and Oma College. Uh, and I know uh, personally, uh, uh, my son is, is at Oma Academy, my daughter was at the, at the school. I, I know the number of folks in the Derg who actually go to school in uh, that particular school. So, 600 underestimate, but nonetheless, the recognition is extremely welcome. Um, with regard to training, uh, oh, sorry, with regard to advice services, uh, I, I would hope that the additional funding to assist advice services will include their ability to actually uh, contact folk in the motor areas uh, rather than sitting in and waiting for people to come to them. Uh, there needs to be outreach uh, throughout the area from the advice services, and sometimes that can be uh, there can be a shortfall in the more remote, remote particular rural areas. With regard to training, extremely welcome. It would be fantastic to have an extra, I think you said 30 folk there who would receive the training and be better, uh, you know, their, their ability to assist will be enhanced via that training. I suppose a question maybe uh, because uh, rural councillors tend to find themselves in this situation themselves as well. Uh, given that the advice services are elsewhere. With regard to training, would that be available to councillors in the rural areas if they wished to avail of that when it becomes available? I so said thank you, Chair, for that. And thanks again, Anna, for a tremendous job and well done. Okay, thank you, Alderman Hussey. Um, Councillor Hart. Sorry, Chair, sorry, sorry, Chair, there was one quick one I wanted. Uh, the original hardship fund when it was set up, uh, it, it was almost designed to be catalytic, uh, and I suppose it has been with regard to certain other organisations who are now feeding into that stream. But I think we also had envisaged local businesses buying into the hardship fund. Has that happened? Chair, if you're happy, I'll just come on to clarify that. So. Um, Alderman Hussey, that, that's part of stage two. Um, so the design of stage two would be to identify um, those priority groups that we would want to support in the stage two. And then we would have a campaign that will go out to businesses and other potential um, grant bodies that would be able to help support so that we would have a much bigger pot of money. So this was more saying this £50,000 was more seen as immediate support um, that we could do some interventions um, given the level of need that had been identified before Christmas, where stage two is seen more as a longer term intervention. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, a couple of comments and, uh, you know, and then uh, a few other things. But first of all, again, thanks, Una, for uh, and the team for putting together this very, very thorough report. Um, and uh, again, you know, some of the statistics there just jump out. Uh, you know, uh, relative poverty level in our district area, 23% compared to 18 for across the north. Uh, absolute poverty, 21% compared to 15% for across the north. Uh, over 50% of young people in our district area living in the 20% 20, 20 of the most disadvantaged and deprived areas uh, is just stunning. And this is all pre-pandemic. Um, and that's what's so shocking about this. And, uh, you know, and our, our owner and our team have done a lot of work to try and figure out where we can spend some money. But the reality is we could spend a lot more money because uh, the, the level of need is huge across the district. And uh, no matter what we try to do as a council, it just doesn't going to be enough. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. Uh, we should we should help people as much as we can. Uh, but we are you know, trying to plug the dam here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot more cracks appearing and really, you know, that we're doing this because of the failure, in my opinion, uh, of the executive uh, and the Tories to actually uh, protect people. Um, and we're not just going to sit around and blame the pandemic and all this. This is all pre-pandemic. So, 
you know, we 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 do know why people are living in poverty, right? Uh, a welfare system that isn't fit for purpose that punishes people instead of helping people. We we also know that um, a lot of people who are in work are now in poverty, and the number of people who are working in poverty has went up dramatically. So if you have a job these days, it's no guarantee to be in, uh, you know, to being able to meet your basic needs, and that and that's what's happening here. We also know that if you live in certain areas, certain working class areas. Uh, in our district, that you're more likely to live and grow up in poverty, uh, because that's that's what these statistics tell us. And really, look, you know, th this is my frustration with the executive. Like, we know what the issues are. It's it's a benefit system that doesn't work. It's pay poverty. Uh, it's a lack of investment in in working class areas that cuts across all communities. And we've known this for a long time, but there is, uh, you know, no action. Instead of getting uh, 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 strategies and policies that address it and overturn it. What we've seen is policies that are actually increasing inequality and increasing deprivation. So, you know, that that's um, I think everybody will probably be frustrated at that. But um, I, I'm not very confident that, as I've said many times before, in the executive's ability to actually come up with a strategy that will seriously address this. Um, I think we'll get more more of the blame game in the executive and more in action. So I think what we are doing as a council on, on, on as many fronts as possible is trying to help people here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Una and others were kind of pressed for time to try and figure out where to put some of this money. And of course, we're all hearing stories Hi, about. Martin, can you just yeah, my, end it up there a bit now? Thanks. Sure, sure. We, we are all hearing stories that. Whenever there's funding given for fuel and everything else, it, it goes out the door straight away. So um, I think we have to pile on the pressure on, on the executive to start addressing this systematically while we do everything we can uh, locally. And so thank you again. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hargan. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Chair, thanks for that, man. And I'd also like to thank Una for um, for work on this. And I'm going to keep my prompt or comments brief because a lot of things. Have already been said so far, but I'm just going to focus on some of the rural issues. Uh, I do fully uh, appreciate and welcome that fuel poverty in rural areas has been recognised in the report, and I would definitely like to see the outworkings of that and, and where, um, uh, yeah, what's going to be provided in the future. Um, in terms of digital poverty, it's a, a big issue. And it was mentioned in the the Derg uh, Growth Partnership um, as well, um, that that there was a lot of. Uh, Pupils attend in um, secondary school and, and other areas, and I suppose Project Stratum can't come quick enough um, for a lot of students in, in those areas. But um, just a wee question to you know, there, uh, Chair, in terms of is it rapid? We'll be coming up with an application process. Will they be engaging with the particular schools to identify um, people who are, who are el eligible then, you know, or how is it going to work? Because I know that the, the Minister of Education is this, a scheme in there at the minute. Um, but it's only sort of certain year groups that can apply for for digital devices. I'm just wondering how that's going to work, and is there a time frame for when for when that's going to happen? Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, and if you want to come on there again. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, it, it's Rapid um, that would receive the funding, and Rapid will be working with the three um, rural DAs. Uh, sorry, the three rural um, growth partnerships. Um, to identify the best approach and the mechanism in terms of allocating it and the um, eligibility criteria. Um, they would then present that to Susan and her team for approval. Um, and so that we've got a bit of time between now and the full council meeting so that Susan will get in touch with Rapid um, pending, um, obviously, approval of um, committee and council in relation to that. So a little bit of that work has been done so that whenever um, full approval would be provided that they could go at speed in relation to it. Um, so it'll really, um, I can't answer definitively what the process is going to be yet because Rapid's going to have that engagement um, with the three local growth partnerships and, and to design what that might look like. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor McHugh, were you looking in there or were you just declaring an interest there? Oh, 
just to clear, chair, I'm just declaring an interest as a yeah. member. Of the oh, I was just, I was just aware of it. Sure. sure, thank you. Um, that's everything, and that's all the indicated speakers. And once again, Una, thank you. I'll not ask any more questions because I think everybody's covered that there. So, uh, once again, thank you for all the effort and hard work it's been done. Did much appreciated. Um, item nine: Food Fraud Activities MOU. Uh, Seamus. Thank you, Chair. The reports to inform members of the MOU in relation to activities between County and the National Food Crime Unit, which is part of the Food Standards Agency. Members, the aim of the MOU is to promote close working relationships in order to help protect public from food fraud. This MOU outlines the roles and responsibilities of each of the partners and how information will be shared on food safety matters relating to the food industry and associated supply chains. And members just recommend that you note the content of the report and approve the signing of the MOU. Thank you, Seamus, for that there. Uh, Councillor McHugh. Councillor McHugh, Chair, um, be very brief, uh, just a quick query. Um, obviously, I welcome and happy to endorse the report. Um, anything that um, ensures the, the quality <coughs> of our, our food standards is to be welcomed. But I just have a quick query. While I welcome the collaboration, obviously, with uh, <coughs> other councils in, in England and Wales, um, is there anything in operation um, in terms of collaboration with our counterparts um, south of the border? And uh, I would think that would be um, probably more and focus now, given the the recent developments around Brexit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, through you, Chair. Yeah, there would be uh, ongoing uh, liaison with uh, colleagues uh, across the border, albeit it's a, an informal arrangement, and a lot of the time the the main uh, agency that would uh, be in contact with be the Food Standards Agency. So the their counterparts in the south would liaise on an ongoing basis, and then we would be involved with anything relating to our council area. Hey, thank you, Seamus, for that there. Um, so it was proposed by Councillor McHugh and seconded by Councillor Mooney. Of no other indicated speakers, so we'll go on to item ten. Uh, clean air strategy for Northern Ireland, dear a public discussion document. Seamus again. Members, the discussion document issued by DERA on a clean air strategy for Northern Ireland presents evidence and research on a range of air pollutants and is designed to give stakeholders the opportunity to share their opinions on both sources and potential solutions relating to road transport, households, agriculture and industry. Members of the report outlines where the air quality management areas and the smoke control areas are present within this council area. And further information on air quality monitoring locations is available on the council website. And members, I suppose, in relation to their quality management areas, they relate to nitrogen dioxide, where road traffic would be the, the main source. And in relation to the smoke control areas, uh, it's for particulates uh, linked to coal burning. So, members, some suggestions for councils uh, within the dis discussion document include extending existing smoke control areas and also banning the sale of smoky coal, uh, which would put greater responsibility on the supplier rather than the customer. Members, the draft response incorporates views and recommendations from across the council services, such as environmental health, who are responsible for the air quality management and monitoring, the planning service with respect to local development planning, and the energy and climate change teams with respect to climate adaptation plan. Remember, you're asked to consider and approve the draft response to the Clean Air Strategy public discussion document. Okay, Thomas. Thank you for that there. Um, I have no indicated speakers. Can I have a proposer and seconder in that? So proposed, Morris. Okay, Morris. Yeah, thank you. A How about a second, sir? Show me. Okay, um, so item 11, Pave and Cafe licensing scheme. Uh, Seamus again there. 
Thank you, Chair. Members, you'll be aware of the difficulties, including restrictions, which have impacted the hospitality sector, including bars, restaurants, and cafes over the last 11 months. Chair, in June 2020, Council agreed to waive the fee for paving cafe licenses until January 2021 in order to support businesses during the pandemic and particularly adhere to social distancing requirements. Members, due to the difficulties experienced by the hospitality sector to date and the uncertainty around future restrictions, it's recommended that the applications for paving cafe licenses remain free of charge until the 31st of August 2021 and the expiry date for existing licenses uh, be extended to the 31st of March 2022. So proposed here, Councillor McKee. Happy, happy to second, Chair, Councillor Riley. Mid Chair. On your chair. Apologies. Um, the one that it's bigger, so we'll go on to uh, item 12, Department for Communities. Uh, make the call for wraparound service. Seamus again. Chair, this report outlines the benefits associated with the Council's home safety and for warrant services sharing data and making referrals to the Department for Communities. Make the call wraparound service. Members, the report also outlines the, the basis for the data sharing agreement to ensure compliance with data protection regulations. And therefore, it's recommended that the Council's Health and Community Wellbeing Department sign up to the data sharing agreement with the Department for Communities to make the call wraparound service. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, Morris, so proposed. Seconder, please. Tricia. Patricia, do you, are you looking in there? No, I just want to welcome, welcome that. I think it's a, a good idea, but just, just to say. Second it, no bar. No All right, bar. thank you, Shimon. Thank you. And Shimon, we go on to item 13, and I would say there'll be nobody who wants to speak in this here at all, so go ahead there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Chair, the report provides members with an update on actions being taken by the Dog Control Service. With the support from a number of council services, including environment, leisure, and the media and marketing teams, to help address concerns raised at previous committee and council meetings about dog found in the council area. Members of the report outlines actions taken uh, to increase support activities through cross departmental working. To increase visible patrols across the council area with support of staff from leisure services, including staff who have been furloughed. And the report also covers the media and marketing campaign to encourage behavioural change and promote responsible dog ownership. Members, you'll be aware that the mayor is also visiting a number of areas across the council to highlight the problem with dog filing and it's recommended we report any instance to the dog control team in order to ensure the area is clean and enforcement officers are able to try and identify those responsible. The findings of these initiatives will be brought back to a future, future committee meeting uh, chair for members' consideration, and the findings will be used to prepare a long-term action plan. Members of the report also outlines the difficulties of implementing a DNA registration scheme at this time. And chairs recommend to this committee note the measures being taken and approve the future initiatives, including the marketing plan, to help address dog farming in the council area. Okay, thank you, Seamus, for that uh, report. And um, the catered speakers, we have Rachel, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Seamus. I'm happy to uh, propose the, the report. Um, I welcome it. Obviously, drug violence has been a huge issue, and I, I welcome the Mayor coming out, um, and he's going to be coming out and do the Ina Ward next week. Dog filing, obviously, I can see in the report DNA is going to be hard work, especially if you it's not compulsory um, unless you, you get it done pre-dog. I know with our dog licenses at the moment, they are compulsory, but some people don't apply, even though there's easy application online and through the app, and it, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, uh, just a few questions, Seamus, on it. The text messages that were refers to, I'm just wondering, was there a target audience to them? Because I know being someone with my own dog's license, I didn't get any at all. Um, 
and I wanted to know whether it was a certain area that they were targeted at. And within this kind of report, is there room for extra dog bins? Um, or is there a policy? Obviously, in some of the areas you see, uh, there's there's a load of dog dog fouling bins, and they're all along the main roads and main pathways. But what I've been having is a lot of residents come to me that in the quieter areas of villages where maybe you just older people are walking around and they're not necessarily on the main roads. They're they're in the cul-de-sacs. There's nowhere really for people to. No dog bins, and they were wondering whether that was a policy, as in it had to be in a high traffic area, or whether there there's a policy that we could maybe put in place and more frequently in um, distance from each other. So, no, um, happy to see the work going forward, and I, I look forward to the the campaign and and the mayor out on his travels, and seeing all the the uh, dog fighting areas. Um, so happy to propose. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rachel, for that there. Um, uh, Councillor Logue. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Seamus, for the very detailed uh, report. I suppose this is uh, an issue that uh, we have been batting around for a, a long number of years, and it is good to see, see that there is going to be more uh, employees that have the the the, the right to go uh, and do whatever as she finds or whatever. I do think it is important to to engage with all the community groups within the area because I do think that that would be invaluable. It has proved very successful uh, in the past. I do know that um, a few years ago, uh, the BBA, uh, the Brandwell and Bogside neighbourhood, Team, they would have engaged in a, a, a project which was very good uh, and it was a partnership uh, approach with yourselves and as, uh, we did uh, and oh, I was talking to a number of uh, your colleagues across the uh, across the council of cleansing uh, the dog wardens and that and BBA sorry I'll just point this room uh, that um, you know, um, we were uh, going to do other initiatives of the same type. However, uh, the pandemic uh, paid to this, um, but hopefully they can um, resume again uh, in the future. Um, the I, I was going to ask, you have got a number of, of streets, high, high incident streets, um, listed there in, in one of the appendices. Um, I, I was rather surprised not to see uh, a number of streets that I would have um, phoned up about on a regular basis. Um, um, and I, I, I was just uh, in my area, you know, the area which I love. Um, you know, sometimes there have been weekly reports from myself and they different. Um, you know, should it be the cleansing department or whatever, uh, as a uh, you know a hotspot, let's say, um, because it was um, on the way towards the line. Um, so I would just maybe um, maybe offline I'll get a another uh, conversation with me about about that. But I do think going forward, given that it is a very very topical issue and it's one that. You know, this council wants uh, to get um, to grips with, I suppose, that when this new uh, system of work and beds in, that maybe for a while at least, that we, we bring a weekly report, of, or not a weekly report, sorry, it's scary there. <laughs> uh, she was maybe a monthly or bi monthly report to this committee so that we can see um, how, it's, how it's working out on the ground. Uh, and that's a proposal from myself, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, if you just want to, if you only put it in the box here, it's simple enough anyway. So, um, Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Seamus, for the report. Can I initially say it's a bit under uh, uh, 4.3 to see the uh, the information that there are going to be more boots on the ground that can, will, can only help the situation 
Uh, I suppose it is disappointing with regard to the DNA scenario. I'm looking at 3.2.18, uh, where it's unlikely that irresponsible dog owners would avail of this scheme on a voluntary basis. Uh, and I suppose that there is that element to it. Uh, but I wonder, is there any possibility that DNA, uh, you know, the registration of DNA could be combined with the chipping process? But again, <laughs> maybe we're talking about irresponsible dog owners who, who yep, not like this. But it's just a thought that the two could be brought together. And obviously, it would be a long term issue because as those younger dogs uh, grow up, etc. But uh, it's just a thought. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney, or sorry, Alderman Hussey. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thanks for that, man, Chair. And uh, again, want to thank uh, Shamus for his work on this. And like uh, Alderman Hussey, there, it's, it's, it is disappointing to see the challenges um, with with DNA testing. And having read some some council minutes in England, I see that they are facing similar challenges. And it looks to me. Like it is an issue, maybe that Starwood could look at, maybe um, in the future. So I just want to ask about uh, the CCTV. I know that there, there are uh, mobile CCTV units for, I think for for uh, illegal dumping and, and stuff like that. I wonder, are they the same ones that are going to be used? I also want to ask about the the furlough staff chair. Um, I wonder could she must confirm how many extra staff will be brought on. Um, and the dog control, and how many are there at the minute, and how many extra will be will be uh, brought on? Um, and I'd also like to welcome the the mayor's initiative. He is uh, going out with the dog warden, and um, uh, I've requested to go to San Bulls myself. I could bring him all over to there, um, but he, he has refused my request uh, so far. But I, I do welcome that. And again, the same as Councillor uh, Logue there. There's especially two areas: Shimas and Page 122. And the Dare DA are left out of that, and and that's Garvin Road and the Glebe, and and Main Street Claddy, which which are left out. And I've been on the dog control and I spoke to uh, cleansing services on a number of occasions. So I, I would definitely like to see those two areas added. Thank you, Chair. Edwards, I'll let you, Seamus, come in there. Not... Yeah, th thank you, Chair. In relation to the CCTV cameras, uh, we do have uh, two cameras and. Prior to installing them, we would erect signage uh, for the period of a few days as it's required within the, the policy. What I would say is when we do put up signage, we would find that we wouldn't uh, obtain footage in relation to offences, which in one sense is a good thing in that the, the local dog walkers are obviously adhering to the, the guidance. Uh, in terms of the furlough staff, we have approximately 20 staff on the uh, system at the minute, and we're liaising with HR on an ongoing basis, and hopefully that'll increase over the next couple of weeks. And we will add those areas that uh, Councillor Edwards has referred to onto the the schedule for patrols. Okay, Chairman, thank you for that. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. Uh, and this is a, an ongoing issue and around dog fouling across the whole council area. So it has, even in the urban settings and rural villages and rural areas as well, and especially in our green areas uh, and in around our play park provision. But I welcome the report coming forward here. It's good to hear that there are extra feet going on the ground, the mayor's getting involved in it as well. So I have to congratulate him on that initiative. And look, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, we have we have tried a lot of initiatives. I see. Look, we're giving out um, dog fouling bags at a cost of forty thousand dog fouling bags at a cost of two thousand pound. And you know we have had initiatives of bins and signage initiatives. Uh, and you know at the end of the day, the the signage and the bins. You know I know said put your poop in here and. No dog fouling and stuff like that there, but the poor dogs can't read. Uh, it's down to responsible dog owners here. And look, I'm um, just disappointed to hear, uh, and look, uh, I've been making some inquiries about it. The, the DNA is not compulsory. Uh, and, you know, it has its downfall um, for those dogs that are not uh, um, licensed 
or, or chipped, um, it would be impossible to have DNA tracing for them. But maybe that's something that, that um, as someone has said, this, that legislation should come from um, the executive. And I'm just reading here, um, all other costs will be covered by existing budgets and penalty receipts. And I hope to see the, pe the, the number of penalties issued over the next six months increase that maybe it would start to cover the um, some of the cost uh, and the initiatives because I think penalty issues as has been questioned here before uh, hasn't uh, even reached a target acceptable it has been very very poor but hopefully with this new initiative uh, Mr Chairman uh, uh, things will look brighter and I was going to say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, but it doesn't fit on this one here. I think the, the results will be the decider on this one. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Alderman DePenny. Um, Edward, did you want back in there? Yep, just two seconds. And thanks thanks for that mention. I just want to ask you, in terms of the, the additional staff that are coming on, will they be actually trained in enforcement and able to hand out fines just like Sort of normal uh, dog control. Will they be able to hand out those fines? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Through you, Chair, there's a number of staff have been authorised uh, to issue fixed penalties across the environment section and the health and community wellbeing section. The staff that will be assisting from leisure will be trained to uh, liaise with members of the public, but they'll not be authorised to issue fixed penalty notices. So where they need support, if they do have evidence in relation to offences and they report it to the dog wardens or any of the other authorised officers, they'll be able to take it forward from there. Okay, thank you. Um, Current Chair McHugh. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just want to concur with previous sentiments of all our councillors. I see that uh, Alderman Jose has Mitchell Park in the chat box there to be included in Castle Laird. Um, which I would totally concur with. Um, I'd also like to have Castle Fun Road added to that in the Castle Berg area, which is a particular hot spot. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ray, do you want a uh, second? Councillor Logue's proposal there too, just when you're there. Yeah, it's so. no problem. Happy to do that, Chair. Thank you. Um, I've no other indicated speakers. Uh, James, I'd just like to ask you, in regards to the enforcement end of it, um, Obviously, dog warden, letter warden, as park ranger included in that, uh, that can hand out fines. And obviously, it's obvious it's to do with uh, certain bans for uh, council employees. But PCSP wardens, they work in the evenings. They see this sort of thing going on, but they're helpless. Uh, could they be included in being able to hand out fines? And what way would we go about that there? Chair, by all means, we'll, we'll liaise with the, the line managers and look at the, the opportunities and any difficulties and try and get them resolved in terms of enforcement and authorization of those staff. The, the park wardens probably would be critical in terms of uh, enforcing the dog control orders, not just fire them, but the dog exclusion and dogs on leads as well, potentially uh, in the future. But we'll, we'll provide an update of the future uh, committee meeting. Okay, thank you for that, Tim. Um, I've no other indicated speakers in that, so we'll move on to item 14, grant date 2021 22. Barry. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, the purpose of this is to update in the process and timelines for our grant aid for financial year 21 22. Protecting members, you'll all be aware we have a community support grant aid a good relations grant aid and a community venue grant aid. Uh, members, you'd be aware that with regard to the community centre venues program, we it was originally for a three year program. And in the midst of COVID last year, we got that extended by council for a further year. So as, long, as well as our normal community support and grant aid programs, we're going out for a new three year program members for our venue fund. Um, a further report we presented members when, when budgets are confirmed by council and their external partners, such as the executive office and DFC. So in terms of the recommendation members that you approve the proposed process and timelines 
for community support, community centre venues, and the Good Relations Grant Aid Programme for 21 22. All right, thank you for the report. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Chair, and I welcome the report coming forward from Barry, and I have no problem in, in, in proposing that. It's vitally important that we get this um, funding allocated or through the uh, all the grant aid programs all sorted out because a lot of these groups out there are, will need this support um, uh, as we move through COVID and we come out hopefully on the other side and just welcome the report and the good work that has been done. Thank you, Thanks, Alderman Chair. Okay, thank you, Alderman Devine. Uh Councillor Burke. Chair, and just a second, the, the report um, and somewhere of what uh, Alderman Devine there said, there's no doubt it's part of the Community Recovery Programme project and initiatives that will be run out under this funding. Hopefully should bring back and assist bring back normality for communities following what's been a tough and challenging 12 months for both the groups and the communities themselves. So happy to so second the proposal. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Uh, no other indicated speakers. So we'll go on to item 15, uh, Sport NI Draft Corporate Plan 2025. 2025. Karen? Uh, Chairman Barry is going to be presenting yeah. the report yeah. because in his capacity uh, as service, he will be um, preparing the response. So I'll pass over to Barry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Members, the purpose of the report is to advise you and seek views on the Sport Northern Ireland draft corporate plan. It's currently out for public consultation and to promote amongst members and the wider sporting community the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft plan through the citizens based survey. Members, you'll see within the report that Sport and I have launched the public consultation for their draft plan for 2020 to 2025. The delivery of the plan will be influenced through the strategic development and building of partnerships. Um, two key outcomes have been identified. People adopting and sustaining participation in sport and recreation and Northern Ireland athletes among the best in the world. Uh, members of the consultation uh, process provides a further opportunity to inform the development of the plan and a range of feedback is sought from stakeholders and partners and also their needs and expectations. Um, in terms of um, the key elements within the consultation response members, a series of fundamental cornerstones are proposed. Build a positive and inclusive sports culture, promote, promote wellness and well-being, retain a duty of care to all those engaged in the sporting system, and target sport in rural communities and disadvantaged areas and underrepresented groups. These set the background for seven delivery themes, sporting systems, physical literacy, club development, coaching, the value of sport, education and sport and physicality and health. Um, the budget proposals to support the corporate plan are included within the draft strategy members. So in terms of recommendations that members contribute views for a formal response to the draft corporate plan and that members promote the opportunity to provide feedback via the citizen space survey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry, for that there. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Chair, for allowing me in again, and I have no problem uh, in supporting the recommendation here. I think any uh, thing to do with the promotion of sport has to be welcomed. And once again, um, we see a lot of issues um, with the COVID-19. Uh, a lot of sport has been put on the back burner at the moment. And I think any initiative that's coming forward and recommendations that we all, that members contribute to their formal response and the draft corporate plan is welcome. And look, uh, good to hear that to promote sport uh, in rural areas and disadvantaged areas because sport is one thing that unites us all, Chair. So it does, whether you're football, hockey or snooker or whatever it is, we all have our favourites. But thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Barry, for, for the report coming forward there. I, I suppose an issue that has come up over this last while, it, it emerged before Christmas and it's emerged again with regard to another sport, is the question of the uh, designation of a club level. Uh, before Christmas, uh, the Championship uh, Association football clubs were seeking definition as elite sports clubs. 
and of late, of course, Gaelic athletic clubs have found themselves uh, at one stage being designated as elite and now being designated as not elite. So uh, the, that's within the COVID situation. But there's also um, over time uh, and funding from Sport NI via the governing bodies, it also creates an issue. So there needs to be some clarity from Sport NI in consultation with the sporting um, governing bodies as to the designation of the level of clubs that they are dealing with. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Uh, Councillor Minnie. Thank you, Chair. Let me state the echo the comments from Alderman Viani um, and Hussey, and I'd like to second the, the, the report as well. But just on a, on a side issue, coming off the report, I think probably we should, probably we should maybe take the opportunity to um, recognise all, all clubs and codes throughout the, the throughout the past year um, for keeping the clubs going through three difficult times. I know last night I had my own AGM and a particular club in the town, the Trelithon Club. Um, we had our new chair installed and different other things. But um, I just want to commend the resilience of local clubs and especially local junior members who um, are going through a hard time. Like a lot of the clubs are doing Zoom sessions, a lot of clubs are doing three WhatsApp groups, trying to keep young juniors interested in whatever code they're in. It's been a difficult year. I just like to um, maybe just ask if uh, Concho could get, could get a message at its own media channels just to highlight the fact that Concho recognizes the fact that we are behind our sports clubs and our, and our junior clubs and our codes. It's been a hard year and that we should, um, and through the reports through Sports NA, that uh, anything we can do to try and help them and to commend them. And obviously, and I understand Barry is doing a lot of work on this. And when the COVID restrictions drop, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Barry's team for clubs coming back in the book sessions and the books. I just think it's a really good idea that we should commend our local clubs, all our codes, through sticking it out the last year. And everybody should obviously um, be commended for that there. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Minnie, for that, and I totally agree with what you're saying there. Um, definitely, we need to show support, and it's been a tough year for sports clubs. Did you want to come in there again, Barry? Or you... no. no, Chair, sorry, um, just oh, right. connection problems. I'm moving between the rooms here, sorry. Um, oh, I, don't, I don't know if there was any, any specific questions, like if there's... In response to Councillor Mooney's request, look, we can work with our, our marketing team around this. Um, in terms of Alderman and Hussey, I'm aware of the particular queries. Um, those, those are queries for, for the Department for Communities and Sport NI. We're, I'm aware that those clubs at championship level um, at football haven't been designated as elite. Um, and the Irish government have said that Gaelic counties are no, are no longer deemed elite sport um, in the south, but that isn't actually the case um, here. There, there still is deemed elite sport, but obviously in all Ireland government bodies. So look, all those comments we'll take on board, um, particularly around the, the COVID crisis, but um, I'm imagining we will receive clarity in the next number of weeks as we come out of, and we get a picture around um, the phases of lockdown um, and what the implications are for sport. Okay, Barry, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor McHugh, just looking on there. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick comment regarding um, angling clubs um, historically have not been considered, um, you know, as a sporting club. And I think that's something that uh, we should be looking at. And I don't know if if it's too late, but, but if those comments could be forwarded uh, in terms of, uh, I believe, angling clubs should be. Um, considered as sporting clubs because they do provide uh, obviously angling activities f for those who wish to take it up and uh, I presume they're not not considered a sporting clubs because of the lack of maybe physical activity but <laughs> I can say from my experience that there's a lot more physical activity involved in it than people may think um, 
But it's uh, just a bugbear of mine that, you know, you have these angling clubs who are providing a, a great service to people, but they find that they can't then um, apply for parts of funding and things like that, you know, because they're not considered a sport club. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McHugh, for that there. Uh, are you talking about wrestling? I've got fish on there. Getting, getting the rubber, usually. <laughs> uh, uh, go on now, the item 16, and it's a draft budget consultation for DFC. Karen? Yeah. Uh, uh, Chairman, firstly, just to, to place um, the context, um, which most of you will be aware of from the, the special meeting on the 8th of January, um, that council um, agreed as part of a second phase of, of, of the motion in terms of writing to the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Communities uh, to respond to the DFC consultation in relation to its budget allocation, particularly around advice services. And the clarification given was that that um, resolution um, would supersede um, that of the Governance and Strategic Planning um, Committee, which um, would not yet be ratified. So, in speaking to the lead finance officer um, earlier today, um, that response um, has been issued um, in terms of the wording within the motion. Um, so, this evening, in, in terms of presenting the report, um, it will therefore seek comments for inclusion um, in um, a detailed response. Obviously, we have captured the comments um, raised at the special council meeting and at the previous um, DSP meeting. But members, rather than dwell on the detail, because you are fully aware um, that there is a draft um, equality impact assessment open for consideration in respect of the DFC funding, um, effectively there is a standstill budget with 92% of that being allocated towards um, set um, expenditure and the other 8% um, considered um, potentially um, to be variable. So um, members, we're obviously very committed um, to um, the funds um, that the council receive um, from the department um, to help improve people's lives, uh, to support people, to build communities and, and to shape places. Um, so this evening, um, just seeing uh, any additional comments that you would wish to make um, uh, above and beyond those that have previously um, been referenced. And I suppose noting that the debate um, more widely um, of governance and strategic partnership or planning um, also took into account the commitments within the new decade, new approach, um, uh, and there is an understanding that further funding will be required to be committed as per the Minister's clarifications um, over recent um, days in the press. Um, so members, just seeking your view, we've set out for you the um, financial implication in terms of the welfare um, mitigating funds of 112,000 and the impact that has um, on our advice services. So um, that's that concludes the, the input on the, the report, members. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for that. Um, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair, and I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible because I have spoke on this twice now in governance and at the special meeting as well. Um, but I just do think it, it's it's worth noting, in fact, that the minister herself is is really disappointed in terms of the budget allocation, and has specifically asked that people do respond to the the consultation, as she is well aware of the pressures um on on her department. Um, I also think that it's worth noting here in terms of where the pressures have come from and why, in terms of the fact that we were supposed to be in two three year budgets, and at this stage, very late in the day. Um, the, the British government has instigated a one year budget, which has completely meant that money can't be carried over um, and other things can't be met. And as if you've said there, Karen, in terms of new decade, new approach, fault and commitments there just haven't been realised that it, they haven't come forward. So all those things need to be taken into the mix and, and in relation to why we are where we are. Um, I do think it's important that we, we do understand that this budget is draft. There has been absolutely no decisions taken as yet. So it is really important that we do make our feelings and our views heard on it. Um, the Minister herself um, has said in terms of the importance of advice services, she absolutely wants to see those continue. She, she can't even countenance the fact that they wouldn't be there to assist very, very vulnerable people. Um, she has also stated her commitment in terms of the continuation of the medications. Um, but also wants to address the loopholes that have 
been identified in terms of the bedroom tax and other um, benefit gaps, um, the benefit cap regulations as well. Um, she's looking at putting additional measures in to support people who have been struggling for years with freezes and other cuts. So I would advise that we, we include these issues as well in any consultation that we put back. Um, we also oh, completely support the scrapping of the six month rule and Minister Hargley has herself said that, that she is pursuing that as, as far as she can in advance of anything coming from Westminster on it. So in relation to that, I would like to see those issues um, included in any consultation response that we put through from the council. But I would also ask people to advise your own political parties or if you're an independent, do it yourself. But please respond to the consultation. We know how important the budget is. And we know how important the Department of Communities is, their services and their budget to very vulnerable people within our council area. And I think that we really we have a duty to respond to this budget at this time. So um, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Carter, are you proposing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, look, I know that this has been discussed a few times in different places, but uh, we're discussing it again. And I think what we should be sending back is that this is a disgrace, that this is completely unacceptable, and this is a disastrous draft budget. Um, and it's unacceptable that we're hearing from uh, Sinn Féin tonight that we have to go out now and do the work uh, that their minister uh, has set up. Um, and there is tremendous cynicism here right across. I've talked to the advice sector workers, uh, I've talked to members of NIPSA, I've talked to Unison, and they, they are just disgusted about this because uh, they're sitting worried about jobs. It's not just the, the million and a half we've talked a lot about in terms of advice services, and it would be unacceptable to lose that. Um, but uh, the, the entire uh, potentially 50 million in bu budget cuts, is uh, it's just astounding. Uh, and what, what's happened here is somebody's come up with a budget and said, here you go, you figure it out. Um, and then uh, we, we can reap the rewards uh, of everybody else's hard work uh, if, if money actually comes through. We're in a situation where, uh, you know, the, there was never uh, funding agreed uh, out of the new decade, new approach discussions. Uh, there was no money agreed to. Uh, that, was, that was a failure that we didn't get money agreed to by the Tories uh, to, to, come, to get Stormont back up and running. And now we're dealing... Uh, we're part of the legacy of that. And then people are looking and going, uh, you know, as everybody has said and pointed out, hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds going on spent uh, at Stormont. Uh, and then we get this budget um, that is uh, dealing again with also the legacy of welfare reform uh, that parties brought in here unnecessarily. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a disaster. And I think that we should be saying in the strongest possible language uh, that... Uh, the the you know it's an unacceptable budget and that the 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 the, the executive has to find the money uh, and more to make sure that these uh, you know potential gaps are are are, are uh, you know that, that that this doesn't come to fruition. Um, I mean there is cynicism as I've said. A lot of people think that this is a game uh, that everybody is being encouraged to to play uh, and to do the work in. But let's remember, I mean, there was parties who, who said that they were leading the fight against welfare reform and then delivered it. So I wouldn't rule out that uh, without people agitating around this, uh, that and, and, you know, engage with a consultation by all means. But we need to agitate those who, who don't want to see uh, these damaging cuts actually uh, push through. And that's what we'll be encouraging, uh, obviously, our, our own reps to do. But that's what we're encouraging people across the board to do today. Uh, I, 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 and I, if people didn't see it, you know, there's another article documenting uh, the impact of this uh, potential uh, funding cut as well uh, in the Belfast Telegraph today from Advice NA. Uh, so I would recommend people people read that if they haven't seen it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I note Councillor Duffy's comment that uh, the minister is, is disappointed with the draft budget, uh, and I would say she's not the only one. Um, there's going to be communities across the north that are equal disappointed, but it's important to remember it's just a draft. This hasn't finalised, uh, but 
what we see in front of us, and we have discussed this at governance, and we have discussed it at the rates meeting. You know, we've discussed this at length. You know, there's 60 million quad of new decade new approach commitments uh, regarding welfare protections that just aren't there at all. Uh, there's one and a half million of funding for the independent advice sector, which is going to impact this council. Uh, it's going to impact local service provision. Um, it's going to impact people across the city and district and their ability to get free and partial uh, and professional advice. You know, we're in a pandemic. We should be enhancing advice services instead of stripping them away. Uh, but it is a draft. Uh, the minister needs to own this. Um, whatever the final outcome of this is, it is the minister's decision. And she, she will need to be held accountable for the impact on local communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Farrell. Uh, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. Uh, and I don't think there's any party or representative uh, at this meeting, or, uh, or I was going to say in the chamber, that uh, is disappointed uh, at the, the, the draft budget. But I think very, very clearly uh, it is a draft bu budget at the minute. And look, I don't want to go get into the political point scoring. Uh, uh, what I would agree is that all parties need to respond to the to regarding this draft budget and raising their concerns. Um, we talked uh, a lot of talk around the, the advice services here. And, Chair, I just want to say uh, I want to declare an interest in the advice service because I sit on that advice services um, committee. Uh, and look, um, there have been talk about the 60 million of the new decade, new approach. Um, a lot of that money hasn't been surfaced yet. But, um, Chair, uh, just want to echo my thoughts with the rest of them that we in the party are disappointed with the draft budget, but we will be making um, our advice known um, through our MLAs uh, at the executive um, around these concerns, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Um... No other indicated speakers than that. Uh, I'll just agree with all the previous speakers. Uh, draft budget there, consultation. So I'd urge all parties to um, fill it out there and uh, make your opinions heard. Um, so going now, to, oh, sorry, could I have a seconder for that there? Second that, Chair Morris. Okay. And we're going to be open for information now. Uh, 17. Legal proceedings. Is there anyone who wants to bring up anything in any of these? Or item eighteen, Councillor Edwards. Uh, it's okay to come, Chair. Are you all right, Karen? I just let them go on. Under you, you want to go through anything there? Or just no, go ahead, go ahead, Councillor Edwards. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Just um. Page one eight two appendix A, the Royal Mail stuff, Chair, and it's just a sort of air my frustration at Royal Mail, and I think the, the mayor received an additional piece of correspondence today to say that the Castle Dare move to Straban is uh, happening at the end of the month, but Royal Mail has disregarded the views of of councillors and MLAs and MPs, and also the the union as well, and, and it is deeply disappointing, and um, that. They haven't listened to this at all, and they've just moved and, and gone ahead with the chair. But I just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, Alderman Hussey, you wanted to come on the same point there? On the same point, uh, uh, the degree of arrogance from Royal Man Mail Management on this whole issue is astounding. Um, and I totally agree with Councillor Edwards. I mean, the mayor has written a couple of times. Uh, prior to the mayor rating, uh, I know that Karen had, had sent off concerns from this council. We sought to meet with them. Uh, up until the last minute, they were they were due to meet on the 21st of December. Uh, unions turned up, and all of a sudden, management didn't turn up. Uh, the mayor has subsequently, twice, uh, as far as I'm aware, requested a meeting the last time our MLAs and our MPs were included in that. Uh, so, you know, a complete snub of the entire elected representatives of the council area at all levels, council, 
Assembly and Westminster absolutely disgraceful from Royal Mail. And, uh, you know, I don't know where we go from here uh, because, you know, you need to speak to these people face to face. But as I say, there's a level of arrogance which is astounding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. And I know our indicated speakers in that, so we go on the confidential. Chair uh, Morris, to, just wanted to say... Sorry, speaking... sorry, sorry, Morris, if you want to come in there, go ahead. Chair, just on, on the Castle Derg, uh, um, round the Royal Mail, um, just on behalf of our party, I want to agree with the rest of the speakers here. There is sheer arrogance uh, and a snub here to public representatives. Um, you know, I thought Royal Mail was better than this, that I thought, they, you know, they're... The people's people out there, uh, and look, they have really snubbed us on this issue. And look, they're going to drive this on, no matter what our concerns. And I don't believe they've taken our concerns on board, Chair, to be honest. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Or sorry, Alderman Devaney. Uh, Councillor Harkin. Yeah, look, I, I, I just want to note that there is a response there from the department for economy about taxi drivers and i, and I know that there has been um uh further action taken on that uh, i i have spoke to some taxi drivers and it does seem like uh there there is uh you know more help but there's also gaps um and uh you know that i just wanted to raise that and uh, uh we we will probably have to come back to this again uh, as long as we're dealing with this uh pandemic and the response to it i think that as we know pa taxi drivers have been one of the groups of workers that have have uh been allowed to you know fall through the cracks and have struggled they are getting some help now but i i still worry that uh not everybody is able to avail of this and that there's some problems with uh the the how uh, <laughs> uh in, in terms of their employers as well in terms of uh, 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 rent costs and so on that workers are having to having to carry. Anyway, thanks for letting me make the point on that. Thank you, Councillor Hargan. Um, and I'll declare pecuniary interest on in that. But I'd just like to say that um, there, there. Hopefully, now the second uh, scheme will be brought forward. I know there's been a few hitches with it. I'm supposed to be come out Monday, then today, and I think it's been put back further. But I think there, there's a few. Um, changes to it which should although i still believe that 250 pound is a, a lot to be taken off someone just because they've taken a month uh payment holiday on their insurance uh the plans for the work around that seem to be okay but again they could be better it's not really uh anything less than the 250 that they're still talking about uh so councillor McHugh. Thanks, Chair. Um, just on the Castle there, post office issue again. When I initially raised that last year, um, uh, our party, an MP for West Rowan, we met with um, Royal Mail on that issue. And I have to say that uh, after that meeting, you know, the perception we had was that this was a fait accompli. And it's disappointing that, uh, that now with other parties coming and elected representatives also raising the issue that um you know we're still met with the same arrogance you know but it seems to be a fit accompli unfortunately thank you thank you Councillor McKee. um so that's it so we're going to be confidential right? so proposed okay. boris okay morris and um, we're just waiting that's for right. the bean to be stopped there 